dear media representatives, it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of my government, on behalf of my minister Dmitro Kuleba, and to start the final point of the architecture of the Crimea platform, which is the Black Sea Security Conference. You know, now we can say and state that the Crimea platform and its architecture has been fully accomplished and complete with its leaders level and the inaugural summit that we had in Kiev in 2021 before the full fledged invasion start. The second line and domain of the Crimea platform is the forum and the summit that we had on the parliamentary level, which happened in Zagreb uh, in October 2022. And then this Black Sea Conference as the final point and brick of the uh, Crimea platform. What we expect. Bună dimineața, îmi face duesc astăzi la București două evenimente foarte importante. Este vorba despre conferința, se pare că... Mă auziți? Da, acum mergem. Bună dimineața, am face o deosebită plăcere să găzduiesc astăzi la București două evenimente de o importanță deosebită. Este vorba despre conferința privind securitatea Mării Negre, prima de acest fel organizată sub egida platformei internaționale Crimea, împreună cu Ucraina, împreună cu Ministerul Afacerilor Externe din Ucraina, Ministerul Apărării din România și Ministerul Apărării din Ucraina, precum și a doua sesiune a trilateralei între România, Republica Moldova și Ucraina, după cea pe care am organizat-o anul trecut la Odessa în luna septembrie. Ambele reuniuni reprezintă evenimente de importanță deosebită pentru România, pentru București, care iarăși devine, după reuniunile pe care le-am găzduit în noiembrie anul trecut, reuniunea liderilor de la München și reuniunea ministerială NATO, devine din nou capitala internațională a diplomației. Avem prezență astăzi la conferință, foarte multe delegații, sunt peste 20 de delegații care participă fizic, de asemenea încă șapte delegații care vor participa în format virtual, mulți colegi de-ai mei, miniștri de externe din Uniunea Europeană, dar și din alte regiuni, din India Pacific, iată Australia, Japonia și alte state care doresc să participe la această conferință, peste 250 de delegați din peste 30 de țări care vin astăzi la București pentru a participa la acest eveniment. 
Așa cum am anunțat deja în cursul zilei de ieri, din păcate, domnul ministru Dmitru Culeba nu mai poate să participe în format fizic, dar va participa în format online, din cauza evenimentelor de securitate și evoluțiilor de securitate care au avut loc recent în Ucraina. Și am condamnat ieri și voi condamna și astăzi cu multă fermitate violările dreptului internațional umanitar, crimele de război care au fost comise în Ucraina și este necesar ca comunitatea internațională să pedepsească aceste încălcări grave ale dreptului internațional. Este pentru prima dată când România și Ucraina organizează un astfel de eveniment. Este o expresie importantă a solidarității și a susținerii pe care România o acordă Ucrainei. Este în același timp o expresie a încrederii pe care Ucraina o are în cooperarea cu România. De asemenea, trebuie spus că importanța acestei conferințe rezidă în obiectivul pe care îl propune, și anume să discute lecțiile învățate în urma conflictului din Ucraina, să tragem concluzii cu privire la modalitățile în care putem să contracarăm efectele agresiunii ruse asupra Ucrainei, atât în ce privește Ucraina în sine, cât și în ceea ce privește celelalte state vulnerabile din regiune, în special Republica Moldova, dar și Georgia. De asemenea, dorim să contracarăm efectele războiului hibrid, războiului informațional, războiului cibernetic, pe care Federația Rusă îl instrumentează împotriva regiunii, împotriva statelor europene și uh, aliate. Este în egală măsură o conferință care se concentrează uh, nu doar pe dimensiunea hard a securității, ci se concentrează și pe uh, aspecte care țin de uh, libertatea navigației, libertatea comerțului, pe facilitarea rutelor de transport de energie în regiune, într-un cuvânt pe transformarea Mării Negre, după ce acest război va, se va sfârși cu victoria Ucrainei, așa cum ne dorim cu toții, să se transforme într-o zonă de pace și prosperitate. Există astfel de soluții și de aceea dorim să le discutăm astăzi pentru a crea, dacă se poate, o veritabilă strategie de răspuns la aceste amenințări și provocări. Astăzi voi sublinia nu doar rolul cheie pe care România îl joacă în arhitectura de securitate regională, ca dovada faptului că această conferință se desfășoară la București, dar voi pleda și pentru un angajament strategic al Uniunii Europene și al NATO în regiunea Mării Negre, dublat și de o agendă transatlantică solidă. După cum cunoașteți, Statele Unite pregătesc o strategie de securitate pentru Marea Neagră, la care și România a contribuit în mod substanțial. De asemenea, vom discuta despre construirea unei agende consistente de reziliență democratică și de prosperitate în regiune, consolidarea rolului flancului estic în ceea ce privește sistemul de descurajare și apărare al NATO, precum și în ceea ce privește susținerea perspectivei europene și euroatlantice a statelor din regiune. În ceea ce privește reuniunea trilaterală România-Republica Moldova-Ucraina, este arăși un format extrem de important pe care l-am lansat anul trecut împreună cu colegii mei din Republica Moldova și din Ucraina. De data aceasta, în premieră, ne concentrăm asupra dimensiunii de securitate. După ce anul trecut la Odessa, prima reuniune a bilateralei s-a concentrat asupra interconectărilor și asupra cooperării în materie de energie, ceea ce a fost deosebit de util pentru că reuniunea de la Odessa s-a desfășurat cu aproximativ o lună înainte de bombardamentele ruse asupra infrastructurii critice energetice din Ucraina, care au determinat perturbări grave ale alimentării cu energie electrică pentru Republica Moldova și pentru Ucraina. Astăzi, în cadrul reuniunii trilaterale, vom discuta despre toate provocările de securitate asupra atât a Ucrainei cât și Republicii Moldova, Vom discuta cum să contracarăm agresiunea militară rusă și efectele acesteia, cum să contracarăm acțiunile hibride împotriva Republicii Moldova, vom discuta despre evoluțiile legate de dosarul transnistrean și, nu în ultimul rând, vom adopta o declarație comună care va concentra angajamentul nostru de a ne întări cooperarea în acest format trilateral. Dorim să transmitem mesajul că securitatea Ucrainei și Republicii Moldova sunt interconectate și, în același timp, dorim să transmitem foarte clar mesajul că susținerea pentru consolidarea securității Ucrainei, pentru consolidarea securității Republicii Moldova, efortul României în acest sens, reprezintă o contribuție directă la întărirea securității României și a cetățenilor români. Sper că discuțiile de astăzi vor aduce rezultate foarte bune, concrete, 
și în acest fel România își va reconfirma profilul de actor regional relevant ca aliat de încredere și ca furnizor de stabilitate și securitate în regiunea Mării Negre. Vă mulțumesc! Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, uh, dear journalists, media. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Elena Frolova. I'm representing Center for Defense Strategies. I'm one of the hosting uh, parties of the conference. And we are very glad that this conference happened. Actually, we planned it for a few years. We planned it before uh, the full-scale uh, invasion of Russian Federation. Uh, and I think that this is a good, very good example that uh, the Black Sea for a long time was out of the attention of the uh, community of NATO, of leading countries who can uh, support the security of this region. And actually this conference is planned to bring Black Sea back on the political map and to develop the discussions about the future security configuration of the Black Sea. Uh, we as the Black Sea nations, we and Romania and other Black Sea nations should play the substantial and leading role in bringing back the peace to this uh, sea and land. And uh, the conference actually combined here the efforts of experts and efforts of officials. And uh, experts, representatives of expert network of Crimean platform developed their recommendations, which I do recommend you to have a look. This is a non-paper which is delivered and which will be presented today to political decision makers, where we have a practical recommendation what we can do for now to make the Black Sea region more sustainable and how we see the future configuration, how we see the role of NATO, of US, of UK, of any substantial player of Turkey and how we see the role of the regional uh, powers. So I do encourage you to listen attentively, to have a lot of uh, difficult questions. And thank you one more time for paying attention to this conference. Let's make the Black Sea a peaceful and sustainable region. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bucharest. We are about to start uh, in two minutes. So please take your seats. Thank you. Dear Ministers, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is for me a great honor uh, to open here in Bucharest the first Black Sea uh, Conference under the aegis of uh, the International Crimea Platform. And I am grateful to my colleague, uh, Minister Angel Tilver, for his partnership in making uh, this conference a success. I'm sorry that due to uh, unforeseen but very objective and very dire challenges related to the war, that my colleague and friend, Minister Kuleba, is not able to be here with us uh, today in physical presence and needs to intervene via VTC. This is another cruel reminder of the impact of the war and that peace cannot come at any cost. I know, dear Dmitro, that this event is very uh, dear to you and that you would have made everything in your power to be here. Romania strongly condemns the horrid and atrocious crimes committed by Russia and reiterates that all those responsible must be held accountable. Dear participants, I would like to suggest a moment of silence for the victims of this irrational and unjust war. To intervene via VTC. This is another cruel reminder of the impact of the war and that peace cannot come at any cost. I know, dear Dmitro, that this event is very uh, dear to you and that you would have made everything in your power to be here. Romania strongly condemns the horrid and atrocious crimes committed by Russia. Thank you so much. And reiterates that all those responsible... Dear friends, today we have a full day of dear firsts, of like premieres. It is the first ever security-focused conference of under the Crimea platform, and for Romania, it is of particular significance because it is focused on Black Sea security. It is the first time that Romania and Ukraine organized together such an important uh, event. And later today, we will also have another first, which is the first time the trilateral Romania Republic of Moldova Ukraine, which was last time uh, first uh, organized in uh, Odessa uh, in September, in the format with our ministers of defense in order to discuss security issues. So I am delighted to welcome to Bucharest our Ukrainian partners and friends. And I would like to acknowledge the presence here of Mrs. Emine Japarova, first Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. Thank you for coming. The Romanian-Ukrainian partnership in organizing this conference could not have been more appropriate. Dear Dmitro, dear Oleksii, this event is one more proof that Romania, our region, and, as a matter of fact, the whole world stands in solidarity with Ukraine and commends its extraordinary resilience in the face of the brutal Russian aggression. We continue to mourn the victims of Russia's uh, war against Ukraine, and we must continue to push for accountability for the crimes committed in your country. 
Romania stood by Ukraine in the very first day of this aggression as a neighbor and a true friend. As a pillar of regional stability in the Black Sea area, a provider of security, Romania has promptly granted a multidimensional response. We have demonstrated to the Ukrainian people that we are together in words, but also in deeds. We have offered support to over 3.9 million Ukrainian refugees, while also facilitating the transit of almost 15 million tons of grain from Ukraine through our territory. I reassure you that the Romanian support towards Ukraine will continue. We will also resolutely accompany Ukraine on its European and Euro-Atlantic path of integration. And I want to reaffirm Romania's full determination to continue our multidimensional support for as long as it takes to win this war. We all want peace. Peace in full respect of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine, in full respect of the UN Charter, and of the fundamental principles of international law. But negotiations can only start when Ukraine is ready, and the victory will look like in the way Ukraine will define it. Distinguished audience, your presence here today is vivid proof of our common goal to reverse Russia's aggression, to defend our common security and values, and to consolidate the rules-based international order. We are gathered here because we all have a stake in the security of the Black Sea, its present and its future. I welcome your presence and your interest. Unfortunately, the events of the past year have confirmed what Romania was already warning about for quite a number of years. Instead of peace and stability, the Black Sea region has become the primary target of the Russian aggression. For years, Russia has weaponized every mean at its disposal to keep the countries in the area in what it sees in a totally illegitimate way as its sphere of influence. Protracted conflicts, corruption, energy supplies, agricultural exports, hybrid tactics always accompanied the Russian actions and such behavior will continue. Close partner countries in the region, like the Republic of Moldova, are increasingly impacted by Russian pressure. Russia has expanded control over the northwest basin of the, of the Black Sea in close proximity of the Romanian waters and implicitly the allied territorial waters. In effect, placing constraints on economic activities, posing outright challenges to maritime, maritime transport and impeding the freedom of navigation and increasing the risk of miscalculations. Ladies and gentlemen, the strong and united reaction of the European Euro-Atlantic community and their global partners challenged Russia's behavior and hopefully discouraged other actors from using the same tools and patterns of aggression. But we must do more. Romania's position is clear and has been stated on numerous occasions, including at the NATO foreign ministerial that I hosted in Bucharest last November. The first such type of allied formal reunion on the eastern flank after the beginning of the war against Ukraine. The Black Sea is critical to the collective security of NATO, to the future of European security and prosperity, and to the rules-based international order. Romania is doing a lot to strengthen Black Sea security for NATO and EU members, and as well as for our partners, be it Ukraine, the victim of Russia's aggression, or for, as I previously said, the Republic of Moldova and Georgia, who are, after Ukraine, the most vulnerable to Moscow's pressures. NATO's new strategic concept states, as Romania strongly advocated, that Russia is the most direct and serious threat to the alliance and that the Black Sea is of strategic importance to Euro-Atlantic security. Given the historical decision adopted in Madrid last year, NATO is transforming its posture, especially on the eastern flank, in view of ensuring the forward defense. As we prepare for the NATO summit in Vilnius, we need to work for the full implementation of the decisions taken in Madrid especially those related to the defense and deterrence posture on the eastern flank, including at the Black Sea. We are also firmly standing by the Open Doors policy and the Bucharest Summit decisions. We will work towards a strategic alignment of NATO and Ukraine, just as I have supported at the beginning of April the resumed NATO-Ukraine Commission after six years and where I have participated together with Minister Kuleba. It is clear that Ukraine is essential to our future European security just as the Republic of Moldova. For Romania, at national level, it is more than clear that the consolidation of the security of Ukraine and of the Republic of Moldova means the consolidation of our own security. Our support through the voluntary contributions to NATO defense capacity building programs and through the European Peace Facility to Ukraine and Republic of Moldova is a clear proof 
that our investment in consolidating their resilience continues. Guaranteeing hard security is the foundation for security in general, but not its sole component. Security also means societal resilience given by democracy, by individual liberties, by rule of law, by accountability, by fighting disinformation, and having reliable food and energy supplies. Safety of critical infrastructure is also a prerequisite. So we must work together towards strengthening all these other components. Dear guests, Romania advocates for a joint NATO-EU long-term coordinated strategy with a strong US presence and involvement in order to consolidate our security, prosperity, democratic resilience, and connectivity of the region and support the advancement of legitimate European and Euro-Atlantic aspirations. In NATO's long-term adaptation process, a strong foothold of the alliance in the Black Sea is a must. Within the alliance, we have to call for a permanent, sustainable presence along NATO's entire eastern flank with a solid component in the Black Sea. Romania will continue to work with our NATO allies to develop a regular rotational maritime presence in the Black Sea and defend freedom of navigation. We welcome the high interest of the United States in the Black Sea and look forward to our strategy, that to, to our partners' strategy in the area, as Romania has already sent its contribution in this regard. We welcome the broad anticipated focus of the approach encompassing security in all its formats. Additionally, we will work within the European Union on coordinating a strategy to support democratic initiatives and economic prosperity in the region, which includes European Union members, but also European Union aspirant nations. Other EU-related instruments or NATO programs or regional initiatives, such as Bucharest 9 formats and the Three Seas Initiative, provide valuable avenues to increase the strategic resilience of the countries in the region. The President of Romania, Mr. Klaus Johannes, will host in September the Three Seas Initiative Summit, and we are working hard to prepare effective and substantial deliveries. All the above should serve to develop opportunities for increased investment and economic expansion, particularly on energy, climate and transport and digital infrastructure. On a global scale, efforts must be redoubled to counter Russia's propaganda and misinformation, which aims at breaking our unity and solidarity. At the same time, measures to prevent agriculture-related crises in vulnerable countries, especially in Africa, would clearly bolster the credibility to our actions and efforts. Dear friends, Romania's top priority is to transform the Black Sea region from an area of conflict to an area of peace, stability and prosperity. Restoring peace and stability in our area will require a long-term effort. Mutual solidarity, unity of purpose, coherence in our actions are key requisites for success and crucial for mutual long-term security and prosperity. Adaptation to the new regional and global realities is now the challenge of our time. And it is something we need to deal with head on. The Black Sea is a mirror in which the European continent and the world can see what their future will look like. It will be either free and democratic or ruled by fear, by hatred and the will of the most powerful. It is up to us to shape our future. Our discussions today will also chart this way forward. I'm sure our debates will contribute to fostering ideas on how to increase security in the region in order to transform it in a true sea of peace, stability, and prosperity. Thank you. Dear Dmitro, I'm very glad to see you online. I hope you can hear us. I hope. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Uh, good. It is. I see Bogdan speaking, so I will wait until he puts his microphone down. Dear Mitro, can you hear us? Now I can hear you. Wonderful. So I'm very glad to invite you as co-host of this conference to uh, take the floor, and I want to express my gratitude to you, Dmitro for the uh, initiative of organizing this event in Bucharest. And I'm very sorry that you couldn't make it in physical presence, but we do understand, all of us, this terrible situation that you are facing and you have to manage. So, you have the floor, dear Dmitro. You're welcome to Bucharest Online. Thank you. Dear Bogdan, dear Nico, dear Oleksii, ladies and gentlemen, I, I 
sincerely regret not joining you in person in Bucharest today because of the developments that have kept me in Kiev. I began my working day with, I think, the same the same task as my dear colleague Oleksii, making calls, texting messages about um, on the on speeding up deliveries of weapons uh, to Ukraine. This is what he and me do on 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 the daily basis, 24/7, to speed up the preparations for the uh, for the counteroffensive of of uh, of Ukraine. And of course, we were all devastated yesterday by the uh, horrified, by the by the horrible video. And uh, we spent the day yesterday uh, mobilizing international reaction to this horrific crime. Today, uh, first of all, I, I, I thank you, Bogdan, for supporting this initiative to call together this forum and give a closer look at the present and future of the Black Sea region. The International Crimea Platform has proven to be an effective mechanism. It has brought together peace-loving nations which oppose aggression and occupation. We are united by UN Charter principles and the shared conviction that Crimea is Ukraine and it will return under Ukraine's control. And every time you hear anyone from any corner of the world saying that Crimea is somehow special, and should not be returned to Ukraine as any other part of our territory, you have to know one thing. Ukraine categorically disagrees with these statements. There is no difference between Simferopol, Donetsk, Lugansk, Kherson, or any other Ukrainian city. They all will, must, and will be Ukraine again like Kherson already did. I think we all agree today that Russian aggression has broken our region's security into many pieces that need to be put together anew. Many of us thought the 21st century would be one of peace, development, and cooperation. Unfortunately, Russia traveled the opposite way and arrived in the 19th century of colonial conquests. Now there is a bleeding wound in the middle of Europe, a dark and surreal time. But as they say, dark times bring forward good people. There is a lot of light, courage and power in those around the world who support Ukraine. I take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you present here or not for standing with us in the darkest hour. We are a community, united not only by common values, but also by common sense and common sea. We all want it to be an area of peace and prosperity, not a war zone. Black Sea is instrumental for making the whole of Europe peaceful and future-oriented. Sadly, Black Sea is also a showcase of how rapidly things can deteriorate if one neglects threats. For years, Russia has been saber-rattling and militarizing in front of us. Georgia, Ukraine, Syria, and Ukraine again. Moscow was launching one brutal attack after another. Many in the West chose to believe that Russians had their own truth. But the one and only truth is that Russia has always prepared for a big imperialistic war with an end goal of holding another Yalta conference to divide Europe into spheres of influence. I regret to say it, but I believe the West had no consistent Black Sea strategy, while Russia has always had one – aggressive, revanchist, and barbaric. And by the way, I would like to recall, to remind everyone, that the first assault of Russia on the territorial integrity of Ukraine took place on the island of Tuzla in the Black Sea, set between the Black Sea and the Azov Sea. So, if we trace this aggression back to its very origins, it was the Black Sea, the place where the first attempt of aggression began 20 years ago. So Russia did have a strategy. Every step of the way, Russia acted where the West doubted. When fear-driven cautiousness closed NATO doors to Ukraine and Georgia in 2008, Russia quickly responded with attacking both. 
Russia was becoming a maniac, but some leaders decided that the best strategy was to keep the maniac happy, including by keeping his potential victims defenseless. The upcoming NATO summit in Vilnius is the right time to correct mistakes of the past by taking resolute step forward on the path to Ukraine's NATO membership to show that the door is not only open, but there is a clear plan on when and how Ukraine will enter it. I assume we all understand now that fear is not a strategy. It is time to work out a comprehensive security network for all nations on all the region that feel threatened by the maniac on the loose. It's time to turn Black Sea into what the Baltic Sea has become, a sea of NATO. This war has proven that the security of the region is indivisible. A threat to one is a threat to all. Missiles launched by Russia at Ukraine have threatened neighboring Poland, Romania and Moldova. Russian strikes on Ukraine's power grid provoked blackouts in Moldova. Millions of Ukrainians fled the war. And I thank, I take this opportunity to thank you, Bogdan, and your colleagues in the Romanian government and the people of Romania for embracing Ukrainian refugees. Trade routes were disrupted, and I equally thank you for playing an active role in keeping these uh, uh, routes of solidarity working to help bypass Russian blockade. Black Sea ecosystem was damaged. Russian occupied Crimea keeps posing a threat to everyone. Today, Russia uses all of its hybrid tools to destabilize Moldova. We in Ukraine commend Maya Sandu's leadership in countering these attempts and reiterate Ukraine's resolute readiness to stand with Moldova. Together, we will thwart Russia's malicious plans to sow chaos and instability in our region. We need to address the common Russia problem together. For instance, I support the expert idea to integrate the air and missile defense systems of Ukraine with the ones of the Black and Baltic Sea NATO allies. It also makes sense for Ukraine to be part of the European Defense Initiative, and I've been raising this issue with Josep Borrell um, recently. All these steps are important now, but even more so after Ukraine liberates its territories. Ukraine's victory will be a victory for all of us. To bring this day closer, we need to have strategic endurance and take principled decisions. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, today is the first anniversary of the sinking of the Moskva cruiser, an event that occurred in the Black Sea and enhanced Black Sea security in practice. The formula is simple. The less Russian military, the safer our region is. There will be a day when other Russian warships will follow in the same direction, one way or another. We are working to bring this day closer with the support of our friends and partners. April 13th also marks another sad anniversary. Exactly nine years ago, Russian military groups that infiltrated Ukrainian Donbas spilled the first blood. On this day in 2014, a Russian special operations group led by an FSB veteran attacked a group of Ukrainian officers near the city of Slovyansk. Ukraine's security service captain, 41-year-old Hennady Bilichenko, was killed on the spot, becoming the first combat victim of Russia's war in the Donbas. Back then, the Ukrainian forces still had an order to avoid opening fire because the common belief was that the war could still be averted. But when you are shot at, there is no other way than to shoot back. So a 29-year-old lieutenant, Vadim Sukharevsky, opened fire in return and deflected the attack. This moment set history in motion. Vadim is now 38, a colonel, a brigade commander decorated with the highest award, the hero of Ukraine. He now leads units in the hottest spots of the front line. And I share this old story with you for two reasons. First, to remind that Russia's war on Ukraine started not last year, but nine years ago. And second, to make the point that you can wish for peace, but you cannot pretend it's peace especially when someone attacks you. We 
We all want peace, but a just and lasting peace like the one envisioned by President Zelensky's peace formula, it's not only in Ukraine's, but in all of Europe's and the world's interests to have to see this formula implemented. If the history of the past century and the past decades is to teach us anything, it is that the world needs real peace, not appeasement. Real peace means restoring the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine. Real peace means a safe homeland for the Tatar people in the Ukrainian Crimea. Real peace means grain ships in the Black Sea, not warships. A world under the rule of international law rather than force is what real peace means. That is what we are fighting for. This is what this conference is for not only to win the war, but to win a real lasting peace. If Russia keeps Crimea, once it has rebuilt its strengths, it will use it as a launch pad to invade Ukraine once again and take full control of the Black Sea. We will not allow this to happen. This is why we will liberate every inch of our territory and every last one of our fellow citizens. And that is why we are today calling for a demilitarization of the Black Sea so that peaceful, law-abiding countries can once again use the shared sea to trade, travel, and live freely without fear of Russian warships. Let us persist on the way to this common goal. Thank you for your attention. I wish you very productive discussions today. I'm sorry I'm not in Bucharest today. And as I said yesterday to Bogdan, I owe you a visit. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dmitro, and I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to the visit um, to Bucharest. And uh, I have now the pleasure uh, to invite uh, my uh, colleague and friend, the Romanian Defense Minister, Mr. Angel Tilvar, our co-host, to give his uh, introductory remarks. Minister, thank you so much for the excellent collaboration between our institutions for the preparation of uh, this uh, event and for hosting us in this beautiful historical uh, building. Angel, hai cuvânt. Mulțumesc, Bogdan. Thank you. Dear ministers, honorable speakers, distinguished guests, dear friends, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you here in Bucharest at the National Military Club to debate an issue that has always been of strategic importance for us and which has gained even more relevance in the current geopolitical and geostrategic realms, the security of the Black Sea region. We are meeting at a crucial time. It is the first International Black Sea Security Conference under the aegis of the International Crimea Platform. It is a real honor to have him here in Bucharest for the first time, Minister Reznikov, since the war of aggression started last year in February. I truly believe that as many world stage experts stated, we should look at the Black Sea as the strategic center of gravity. Europe faces the most complex and unpredictable security dynamics in decades. Russia's brutal war of aggression against Ukraine has brought back full-scale conventional war on our continent. The aggressive actions of Russia have increased insecurity in the Euro-Atlantic space and negatively impacted the rules-based international order and the global security. We have been talking about the notions such as inflection point or historical crossroad. Whatever we call it, while the international order is being reshaped, we must real recognize the key role of the Black Sea. The importance of the Black Sea is acknowledged both in the NATO strategic concept as well as within the EU strategic compass. The region is marked for three decades already by significant security risks and challenges, including protracted conflicts, the buildup of the aggressive military posture of Russia, hybrid actions, and not least, the weaponization of the economic and energy instruments. Last year, on February 24th, the international democratic community witnessed 
the true intentions of Russia, which decided to start a full-scale invasion of a sovereign, independent nation. They believe that Ukraine is not a state, that it is a place without a, a nation, but that was a terrible mistake. In the 414th day of this brutal war of aggression, the brave Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian armed forces demonstrated that they are a true nation determined to protect every inch of their territory. Romania stood aside our neighbor and partner since day one. Russia failed in dividing us and it also failed in achieving its military and strategic goals. The international support offered to Ukraine has been a game changer and we consider that we need to continue to sustain Ukraine as long as it will be necessary. After more than one year of war, if we look at the situation on the front, we see that Russia struggles to preserve territories illegally occupied and Ukraine is making progresses in liberating the occupied territories. Over more than one year of ruthless fighting, Ukraine has achieved remarkable and encouraging success on the front lines. Bakhmut front remains an important focus of the war. The fighting in and around the city has been the most violent of recent months. But as NATO Secretary General said, we must not underestimate Russia. The objective of this conference is to raise awareness and to demonstrate once more our unity. Dear friends, I hope this conference, which gathers statesmen, diplomats, and experts in the security and defense related fields, will be both interesting and edifying in profiling the Black Sea as what it is, a region of massive strategic relevance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, for your opening address. And I have now the pleasure to invite the fourth co-host, Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Oleksiy Reznikov, to deliver his opening remarks. Oleksiy, you have the floor. <clears throat> dear ministers, uh, dear distinguished participants of this uh, Black Sea Security Conference, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to express my deep appreciation of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Romania, the Minister of National Defense of Romania, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, my friend of mine, Dmitry Kuleba, and also uh, Defense Strategic, I mean Ukraine, for organization, organizing this important event, not only uh, for Ukraine, but the whole Black Sea region in, and Europe. And as you know, uh, a year ago, on this day, Ukrainian Navy forces hit the Russian flag warship cruiser Moskva. And it became a very important and famous dive spot, dive site in the Black Sea. I believe this is a good symbol of today's event and guarantee of productive work. More than 400 days ago, Russia started a full-scale invasion that has killed thousands, forced millions to flee their homes, reduced entire cities to rubble and caused a military conflict on a scale that Europe hasn't seen for the last 80 years. The invasion made it obvious for European countries that food is used as weapon, energy is used as weapon. And the war spreads its influence far beyond the borders of actual hostilities. Violation by the aggressor of all existing principles of international law and order requires that we reconsider the critical aspects of regional security. This is in the best interest of every country in the region. We cannot rely on the practice we used until recently they failed. Ukraine is open to this conversation, but unity of efforts of the free world we will ensure the return of the world of the rule of law. 
not the rule of force, and will make the Black Sea the space of peace. Thank you very much. I thank you, uh, Minister, for your uh, remarks. And uh, please allow me to, in my, at my turn, to congratulate you for the courage and resilience of our, your women and men defending your country in such a brave way, but also for the core values that you are protecting. And now, let me um, express also my gratitude to all of you who have uh, been uh, traveling to Bucharest for attending this event, but also for those who are online with us uh, or who will present their uh, messages via VTC. Our event is basically highlighting the strategic importance of the Black Sea region and the aim is to chart the way forward. So I hope that uh, we will be able together today during our debates to send a very strong message of unity and solidarity. Before uh, proceeding further with the next uh, uh, panel, I would like to indicate a couple of organizational details. I would like to invite my fellow ministers and heads of delegations to join us to a family photo, which will take place in about 15 minutes in front of the main stairs. We need this technical break in order for the uh, colleagues for the media to prepare their cameras. And then, be, uh, by that moment, please join me into the uh, a holding room in order to wait for the family photo to be ready. And then the next panel will start according to the program. Thank you.
câte locuri sunt? Nu mai întrebați pe nimeni, cu Teodor, vă rog. Băi, vezi să nu dai. Da, da, le punem aici.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start our first panel. Please uh, take your seats. And we encourage the panelists to take the stage. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, distinguished guests, experts, journalists, we are so happy to see all of you and let me reiterate the gratitude that came from a minister for participation for each of all of you because the Crimea platform architecture has been today accomplished. Let me remind you when Ukraine started to push for the Crimea platform, it was not, it was not obvious that it will be successful. We heard so many skeptical voices about that it would not be supported by countries, but today the Crimea platform is the initiative that unites more than 60 states, nation states, and international organizations under one simple goal, to deoccupy the sovereign territory of Ukraine, which is the Crimean Peninsula. And let me state that with this Black Sea Conference, we have accomplished the whole architecture when the Crimea platform is today operated on the government level, leaders level, when we had the inaugural summit back in August 2021, incaptained by President Zelensky. The parliament summit and the parliament level that we had in Zagreb in Croatia, and we are so thankful to our Croatian friends for hosting this summit, the expert layer, the expert domain, and today the, I hope, regular Black Sea Security Conference that has again one aim to accomplish the strategic vision of what we can jointly do at the Black Sea region. Dear guests, I'm also happy to say that uh, there is a huge hope of those who live in Crimea. And as I represent the Crimean Tata indigenous people, and these are 15, 16% of the Crimean population, and the Crimean Tatars have been boycotting the very so-called illegal referendum, and many Ukrainians and people in Crimea, they do have hope. And this event is yet another signal that goes to Crimea. And by the way, it's been closely followed by those who inhabit Crimea. Uh, as, as the mark that the world has not forget Crimea, that the world is fighting for the liberation of Crimea. And as my minister said, if you hear any doubt about the attempt or the eagerness of Ukraine to liberate Crimea, it would not be the case, because there is a unanimous vision of Ukrainian people to liberate the territory. Unfortunately, after the temporary occupation of Crimea in 2014, Russia heavily militarized the peninsula. Crimea has become a military base for Russia, a tool for power projection in the Black Sea and Azov Sea and also in the Middle East. The resort, which annually welcomed people from different cultures, from different countries, a place that boasts an incredible wealth of culture treasures, historical significance, diversity, and breathtaking natural resources and wonders, became a place for persecution, for political views, for ethnic features and religious beliefs. Democratic freedoms on the peninsula were eradicated. For nine years, approximately 200 people became political prisoners of the Kremlin, most of them are Crimean Tatars, for nothing. 
We are determined to regain our land and achieve complete the occupation of all territories of Ukraine temporarily occupied by Russia, including the city of Sevastopol, with the help of our allies, thus restoring the security architecture in the region. To this end, we initiated the International Crimea Platform as a tool, and it's a very solemn moment that today we finalize this architecture. Let me introduce our distinguished panel uh, discussion speakers, uh, and again express my gratitude for your distinguished participation. These are Anatoly Nasati, Minister of Defense of the Republic of Moldova, Arvidas Anushauskas, Minister of Defense of Lithuania. My dear friend, Maria Pichinovich Buric, Secretary General of the Council of Europe and a very dedicated person to the crime and issues. Parliamentary Vice Minister, Simtia Müller, Federal Ministry of Defense of Germany. And then we will also have several messages and shaping intro. But before we go in the shaping intro and the introduction of those who would do that, let us watch two and a half video that would bring you as a flashback to what we had in Crimea in 2014. Let us watch the video. After days on the razor's edge, Ukraine is now a nation at war. Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Denazification and demilitarization of Ukraine. In February 2014, Russia temporarily occupies the Crimean Peninsula. Crimea is turned into one huge military base. Russia blocks the Kerch Strait. International trade through the ports of the Sea of Azov is blocked. Movement of armed forces to the Mediterranean area, primarily to Syria. Would-be nuclear weapons are being deployed. Nuclear infrastructure is being actively restored and developed. During all these years, Russia felt impunity. Massive missile strikes on the entire territory of Ukraine are launched from ships in the Black Sea. There are no more safe zones on the water or in the air. Nine of the top ten global container lines have suspended operations in the Black Sea region. The rapid fall in direct connections to the Black Sea area has affected global logistics and amplified critical port congestion in Europe. A decrease in the export of agricultural products from Ukraine affects food security and increases the risk of new conflicts. Russia's use of ships with disabled transponders fuels the shadow economy and endangers ship traffic in the entire water area. Sea mines which have been discovered near the coast of Bulgaria, Georgia, Romania and Turkey over the past year pose a threat to both sea vessels and people. Russia violates international maritime law. Aggression has environmental consequences. Dolphins are dying en masse. The air pollution is rising, and the development of renewable energy projects is halted. The system that ensured the safety of the Black Sea no longer works. It is our duty to restore peace and tranquility to the Black Sea. The deoccupation of Crimea and the establishment of a new security architecture is the only possible path for humanity. Enough with the talk. Take action. So enough with the talk, take action, but we actually continue our conversation and dialogue. And I have the honor to introduce and to give the floor to our two distinguished experts who would make an a shaping intro. And the first one is Mr. Van Prague, who is the president of the Halifax International Security Forum. Please, the stage is yours. Minister, distinguished officers, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. My name is Peter Van Prague. I'm the president of the Washington DC based HFX, an organization that I started 15 years ago in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Georgia with the mission to improve cooperation 
among the world's democracies. We convene Halifax International Security Forum each November. And as someone with some experience bringing people together, I want to thank Ukraine and Romania, Alina Frolova, and everyone at the Center for Defense Strategies and the Crimea Platform for bringing us together for this important and timely conference. Your non-paper on Black Sea security is important, and I urge everybody to read it. I know that we will look forward to continuing our cooperation together. This morning, I am going to make three simple points that might help shape today's conversation about lessons learned for the democratic world. One, acknowledge where we are. The Black Sea region that we are here to discuss, and as a result, the entire world, are in a much stronger position today than on February 24th, 2022. The world and the region are stronger because Russia is weaker. We cannot acknowledge this significant development in global strategic affairs without acknowledging and indeed thanking Ukraine. On February 24th, 2022, a new era for the entire world, not just the Black Sea region, began. Putin's Russia launched a full-scale invasion of its smaller neighbor, Ukraine, and Ukraine fought back. President Zelensky inspired his nation to defy, to resist, to survive, to win. Counter to the conventional narrative that still lingers in Western capital cities, it was not Russia's attack on Ukraine that brought unity of purpose to the Allies. No, it was Ukraine's defiance. It was Ukraine's sacrifice. It was Ukraine's fight that gave the United States, Canada, the European Union, NATO, and all the Allies unity of purpose. In many real ways, Ukraine saved not only itself, Ukraine saved all of us. Had Ukraine surrendered, as some European leaders urged President Zelensky to do, it's not difficult to imagine where we would be now. A much weakened Europe, a divided NATO, a humbled America, all confronting an empowered Russia backed by a smiling Xi Jinping in China. The Black Sea could have become a Russian pond. That is not where we are, quite the opposite. Because of Ukrainian sacrifice, Ukrainian courage, and Ukrainian ingenuity, the era that began on February 24th, 2022, now has the potential to be the most positive era yet for freedom and democracy. If we needed reminding, President Zelensky's Ukraine taught us all over again, our democracies are worth saving. Our democracies are worth fighting for. And we must be indebted to every single Ukrainian, all of whom are heroes, for reminding us of this fundamental truth. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's just one thing that I wanted to say, that we are strong because Russia is weak, as you said. But I think Russia is weak only because we united our effort and performed our united strength. Thank you, Peter. It's modest. It's modest of you. Yeah. Two, acknowledge past mistakes. Last week marked 15 years since the 2008 Bucharest NATO summit. At that time, I had the privilege of organizing the accompanying conference that took place in this room. President Bush addressed the conference three hours before the official proceedings began 
and announced officially only then that he supported MAP, the membership action plan to eventually join NATO for Ukraine and Georgia. The very next day, that American initiative was rejected by Merkel's Germany and Sarkozy's France and other allies. Seven months before Obama was elected US president, this was the low point for American influence in the world. And Putin invaded Georgia in August. Putin invaded Ukraine in 2014. And Putin launched full-scale invasion last year. A lot of factors went into reject rejecting MAP for Ukraine and Georgia, not least of all America's misguided invasion of Iraq five years earlier. Still, not giving MAP was a huge strategic error. And it, and every other mistake in this region, including neglecting the Black Sea region, and those errors made by Mr. Bush's successors at the White House, needs to be acknowledged by the actors and nations who made them. It is the only and best way to avoid the same mistakes going forward. Three, win the war. Aggression against sovereign states and crimes against humanity were defeated in Europe in the middle of the 20th century. There is no good reason that aggression and crimes against humanity should not be defeated in Europe in the first half of the 21st century. Simply put, Putin needs to fail. And defeating the evil that is coming out of Russia means Ukraine reclaiming all of its territory, including all of Crimea. It is not talked about much, but it is not insignificant for me to tell you that beating German Nazism led directly to getting rid of segregation the institutional racism that existed in the United States until the 1960s. After fighting and dying to stop institutional racism in Europe, Americans could no longer defend such blatant racism at home. However, in 1945, when the war ended, nobody imagined that ending segregation in the United States would be a result of victory in Europe. I say that, I recount that, to emphasize the point that good things happen when the good guys win wars. Many of those good things won't and can't be predicted at this time. At this time, nearly every person, and certainly every institution, can't imagine what the world and the region will be like after victory with a severely diminished Russian Federation. Collectively, we simply aren't creative enough to imagine that future world just yet. But it is coming. And that future world is coming. And what we can predict is that Ukraine will emerge from this war as the strongest land power in Europe. And now, the Black Sea region will benefit from Ukraine's warfighting experience and education as it develops a post-victory strategy to ensure that Russia cannot threaten its neighbors ever again. The post-war strategy must include special roles and responsibilities for Ukraine and its NATO Black Sea partners, Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey. Beginning immediately after victory, Black Sea states and international stakeholders need to coordinate to demine. Simultaneously, a post-war strategy that keeps Russian warships out of the Black Sea forever needs to be devised and acted upon. It is late, but not too late. 
for all the allies and stakeholders to get on the same page with a unified vision for winning the war. Let's do that now. If I have to make one prediction today, let it be this, that Europe itself will soon come to realize that Europe, whole, free, and at peace, what will only happen when Ukraine is whole, free, and at peace, and Moldova, and Georgia. Thanks to Ukraine, there is a lot to be optimistic about in this region, but there is a lot of work to do, and today's conversations are an important part. Thank you. Thank you, Peta. Thank you so much. All of your three points have been well taken when it comes to the uh, acknowledge where we are, the nuclear in Bucharest 2008 huge strategic arrow and win the war. Thank you so much. And the next shaping uh, speaker is Madam Simona Kojokaru. She's the State Secretary of Ministry of Defense of Romania. The stage is yours, Madam. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, distinguished audience, dear friends, a very good morning in Bucharest to all. This first panel focuses on topics that are central to our security. Let me take this opportunity to say, as we do with uh, fervent regularity, that we must be aware of the fact that what happens in the Black Sea does not stay in the Black Sea. The wide-ranging security evolutions have implications at a larger scale. We share common concerns and we should seek opportunities let me thank for your presence here for the first edition of the Black Sea Conference under Crimea platform. It's important to stay united. It is about lessons learned, this panel. The lessons learned from the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine from different perspectives. A lessons learned discussion is a strong tool to drive improvement within our joint efforts in providing security and stability for the Black Sea area. When we think about lessons learned from the war in Ukraine, our understanding implies both positive and negative outcomes. A very thorough analysis of the military operational tactical aspects as well as strategies in conducting the war and the impact of regional, Euro-Atlantic and global order. Successes and failures should be taken into consideration. The price for liberty and freedom is again important to be assessed along with the destruction and suffering caused by the war. More than a year since, in a blatant disregard of the basic international fundamental principles of international law, Russia invaded a sovereign state, an independent state, Ukraine, destroying cities, shattering peaceful communities, and killing innocent people. The international response was prompt, helping Ukraine to resist this brutal aggression and build the capacity to self-defend and to conduct counter-offensive to retake the illegally annexed territories. One of the first lessons is that Ukraine have proved massively resilient. Another lesson might make reference to patriotism, self-dedication, self-sacrifice and Ukraine is indeed a case in point. It is notable that another lesson learned could, be, could include a significant and calibrated military capacity. Moreover, we are witnessing the importance, the value, and the power of international community, either in regional, international formats, individual countries or entities. But at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, we have to make sure that the power of support increases in terms of volume and actors involved so as to reach a level that deters the use of aggressive force against another state in the international arena. The international community cannot favor by any means the use of brute force as an arbiter. The only force that we should breed and make the arbiter is the force of law and the force of right. In front of this absurd 
war of aggression of the Russian Federation in Ukraine, supporting Ukraine has become indeed very clearly, very strongly a global effort. In addition, both the EU and NATO member states have passed a difficult exam throughout this more than one year war with important lessons learned also for these organizations uh, to the common efforts to strengthen the security and stability of the Euro Atlantic community. We have declared many times that Black Sea matters. 2022 NATO strategy concept adopted in Madrid last June, which underscored the vital importance of the Black Sea region for the security of the Euro Atlantic area is the fundamental blueprint of the Alliance. And the Black Sea is there, very well in facet. This is one region where aggressive Russia is using its military force against liberty, against freedom of navigation to impose its vision of a new world order. The Black Sea is an area where the risk of further severe escalations and aggressive maneuvers by Russia remains high. That is why we must showcase a strong resolve. Yes, NATO strategy concept stated also very clearly that Russia today is the most significant and direct threat to alliance security. Moscow is using the Black Sea as a platform to impede, as I said, the freedom of navigation, fueling tensions in the region, including through protective conflicts, including generating gray zones and creating favorable conditions for transnational security threats. Its main objectives are to maintain regional instability impact the free will of our partners in choosing their future while projecting force in the Mediterranean Sea towards the Middle East and beyond. As geography shows, the Azov Sea is also intimately related to the Black Sea. Depending how you look at it, that sea is either the antechamber or the last room of the Black Sea. So the potential of the Black Sea is never fulfilled without the Azov Sea. Therefore, we see them in tandem and take measures appropriately. As a consequence, the involvement of main relevant actors, NATO and EU, should elevate both the Black Sea and Azov Sea regions and its associated problems at the right political level, so the timely and calibrated political decisions to be taken and other means to be generated and employed. Looking around the globe, another theme, another topic in, in the first panel. One cannot hide from seeing there are problems that need attention and brings new urgency to solving them. The terrorism in all its shapes and forms, malicious cyber attacks and widespread disinformation activities, challenges emanating from the South, such as migration, human rights abuses, all of these are domains to be looked very carefully. All these threats and challenges have determined the creation of that arc of instability and insecurity stretching from the Atlantic coast to Sahel, from North Africa, Middle East, Caucasus, and further to Indo-Pacific. These threats and challenges are likely to be exacerbated by a growing world population competing for either scarce resources, climate change, and ever-increasing rate of technological advances. Thus, Ladies and gentlemen, things are going to be based on happening. Having said these considerations, I'm sure that we are going to benefit greatly from your knowledge and experience of all distinguished panelists today. At the end of the day, I think the most important lessons learned is that Ukraine, ladies and gentlemen, is a winner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simona. So now we have one hour, 15 minutes for the panel discussion. And uh, the discussion itself will be dedicated to the name of the uh, panel, which is the lessons learned full scale invasion of the Russian Federation in Ukraine its multidimensional impact for the democratic world. And the first word I would love to give to the defense minister of Moldova, Mr. Nosati, for actually commenting where we are when it comes to the threats 
and what are the lessons learned and moreover, what should we do with these lessons learned? What will be the practical dimension of those lessons learned? Please take your microphone. Yes, you can speak from your place here. Thank you. Can you hear? Let's try this one. Okay, it's working. Uh, dear ministers, honorable audience, ladies and gentlemen, I will try to stick to the time that's been allocated, no more than three minutes, and focus mainly on the lesson learned from the war in Ukraine. The 24th of February 2022 became a major impact upon the paradigm of the security order based on international rules established by United Nations in 1945, as well as OCE principles established in the 1990s, which overall become a major challenges for entire international community. In fact, the Republic of Moldova has immediately felt the collateral and spillover effects from the full-scale, unprovoked and unjustifiable war in Ukraine. In this regard, we express gratitude to our partners for timely shared information that allowed us, Moldovan Authority, to better prepare plans and actions to mitigate the threats and manage many crises situation we all together witnesses. As a lesson learned from the last year crisis management, we came of several conclusions. First, international partnership based on the solidarity principles have to be enhanced with the aim to upgrade interstate interconnectivity and interoperability to allow synchronization of joint international effort and response actions to mitigate different crises such as refugee, logistical, traffic, uh, that we, Moldova, expressed in 2022 and even now. Second, the topic that already been addressed in the previous uh, speeches, it's regarding the airspace. The cooperation need to be enhanced to better achieve the principles of deterrence, early warning, denial and air defense. Another point is international partnership that has to develop and rehearse in advance different contingency play planning based on the preventive strategies and mitigating measures to allow not only national crisis response systems to react, but also to have a joint international crisis response reaction. Fourth, the concept of national resilience that already been mentioned today has to be enhanced and synchronized with international cooperative security efforts. Since the effects of the war, it has multiple collateral and spillover effects for the entire region. Such joint efforts have to be amplified by combating disinformation, strategic communication, cybersecurity response, as well security and defense culture developments which have to include international cooperative security principles. The fifth lesson learned that I would like to mention today is international community has to develop better international logistical capacity reaction. Since the traffic of the logistic goods and traffic of the logistic peoples and goods from the Ukraine trans transiting Moldova, for example, during the last year, overwhelmed the national infrastructure and economic capacity to be sustained for a long period of time. Even in that challenging situation, I would like to mention about outstanding cooperation of the Moldovan and Romanian authorities in order to identify solutions to facilitate the traffic of the refugee the transit of the goods, the transit of the grain in such difficult period of time. Of course, we express our gratitude to the international partners who supported our efforts 
with their experience and their recommendations. How better to achieve interoperability and interconnection with European Union system and logistics. And this next lesson learned is related to the energy, economic, financial crises generated by the Russian war in Ukraine that recommend optimization and synchronization of the energy, energetic, economic and financial system to achieve flexibility and to avoid disruption effects by creating international complex interdependence. Last, ladies and gentlemen, that I would like to mention, apart from the military effects, the war in Ukraine revealed that our challenges such, such as transnational organized crime, transnational illegal immigration, and hidden subversive action designed to destabilize, to destabilize the nation and the region's security that impacted the Republic of Moldova. Therefore, to timely react on such threats and challenges, we need to achieve better international and national coordination to help synchronize crisis response mechanism based on sharing of information and coordination of the joint action response. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many other effects, lessons learned, and recommendations that have been identified through the last period of time. Many time, one lesson become definitely priority. Our common strength has to be based on the international partnership with common shared values and principles of solidarity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anatoly, for your contribution. The only thing, the only remark that I have, that you have up to seven minutes for your remarks because there is a small change. We were supposed to have three rounds of questions, but now it's combined. So please, you will have one round of questions uh, and your remarks. So the next speaker is uh, Mr. Arvidas Anushauskas, Minister of Defense of Lithuania. Please, the floor is yours. Sorry, as a former professor, I will feel <laughs> Feel free yourself. <laughs> Better here. Yeah. Dear ministers, uh, ambassadors, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and pleasure to be in this important forum. Thank you, Romania, uh, for continuing the Crimea platform tradition and uh, for hosting this event. Lessons from Wars are learned over the time, and I am sure the historians will do their job. But in our case, we do not have time. We must move forward. Just last week, I returned uh, from Kharkiv. I clearly saw two things. Firstly, Ukrainians believe in victory, victory and uh, any cost. Secondly, I clearly realized that time is of uh, the essence. Each day counts for the security of Ukraine and uh, our own. In Vilnius, we fully realize that European security depends on the end of this war. Even after the war, Russia threats will remain uh, to all of us, be us in the Black Sea or Baltic region. NATO summit in Vilnius is coming soon. In Vilnius, we must send a strong message to Ukraine of the prospect of its membership. We cannot just repeat uh, the same line uh, as in uh, Bucharest summit. I believe that stronger 
assurances and commitments should be given to Ukraine. Right now, we have to do everything for Ukraine to win. In this context, we must combine political and practical tracks. Firstly, our, our united and constant support uh, for Ukraine is any political format. And in the communication with our societies is crucial. People worry about gas prices, jobs, and infla uh, inflation. I fully understand this. It is our job to explain to our public why supporting Ukraine is more important. Ukraine should never fall alone. We should not get tired in uh, any sense. Secondly, we must stay focused on practical support. Not only for this year, but for many years to come. And uh, it is not only military equipment support, but also training, service and re repairs, cyber security, economic re resilience, our goal it is make Ukraine as much NATO as it uh, can be. Ukraine must be ready for membership as Finland was. On the Ukraine side, we need Ukraine's commitment to uh, proceed with uh, uh, establishing democratic control of the armed forces and the adop adoption of the Western military decision-making process and integration into uh, NATO structures. It is a huge uh, challenge in the wartime, but I know from Alexei Reznikov and other friends that Ukraine is up to the task. The end of the day, NATO will be stronger with Ukraine. Through the bloodshed and courage the Ukrainians have given us time to strengthen our own defense. At NATO, we must take this opportunity. This means, firstly, the implementation of Madrid summit decisions, reinforcements uh, of forward defense, and deterrence in eastern flank, in particular in the Baltic, because of ge geographical situation. Just remember the Russia recent decision to deploy nuclear weapons uh, in Belarus minutes before Vilnius summit. Secondly, it is also important to ensure air defense coverage from the Nordic Baltic region to the Black Sea region. Lithuania itself invests into such capabilities too. Thirdly, at Vilnius we must commit to increase NATO defense spending and make a long-term pledge for investment. Lithuania has already uh, realized uh, defense budget up to 2.5% uh, of GDP. And this is not the limit. It is important to continue, uh, continue investing in the innovation and modernization of the armed forces. Fourthly, uh, we need long-term contract with defense industries. We need industrial mobilization for ourselves and for Ukraine. Today, we are dealing with extremely dangerous terrorist Putin. Ukraine, uh, Ukraine will win I have no doubt about it, 
uh, we must hold Putin and this regime accountable for the war crimes committed in Ukraine. Justice uh, must prevail and it will. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, dear Aridas. Ukrainians do not reject your kind suggestion to be NATO'd, with pleasure. So the next speaker will be with us online, and it's the Sweden Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Tobias Bilstrom. Let us first technically solve the issue, and I hope that everything's gonna be smooth. Mr. Tobias? Hello, dear Minister, can you hear us? But we can't hear you. Could you please fix the technical team? Yes, now we can hear you. Please, uh, Minister, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me first and foremost express my admiration for the Ukrainian people who have shown incredible strength in defending their homeland and the core principles of international law against the Russian aggression. It is truly impressive to witness the Ukrainian resolve in defending their freedom in face of hardship when uh, confronted with Russia's crimes. The choice of the people of Ukraine is one of democracy, rule of law, and respect for fundamental rights. Ukraine is part of our European family. Ukrainians have expressed their wish for a future within the European Union, and we have acknowledged that by giving Ukraine the status of candidate country. The swift and decisive European uh, Union response to Russia's aggression against Ukraine is a manifestation of EU strength when we act together. The Swedish presidency of uh, the EU will continue to prioritize political, financial, military and humanitarian support for Ukraine, as well as support for Ukraine's path towards EU membership. For Sweden, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine has led to a political paradigm shift. NATO membership and a heavy rearmament of Swedish defense are immediate consequences of this. The Black Sea region is of high strategic security value and geopolitical significance as a bridge between Europe, Asia and the Middle East as well as through its importance in terms of military defense, food security, energy, and connectivity. Security concerns in the Black Sea are clear. About 90% of all freight transports in and out of Sweden takes place by sea. Sea routes and ports are of central strategic importance, and we can relate to the challenges states in the Black Sea region are facing. Um, if operations were to stop or be blocked for a longer period of time, there would be extensive consequences. As future NATO member, we will contribute to our allies' security needs in a full 360-degree perspective. This includes maritime security, where the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea share important characteristics. And I want to reiterate Sweden's intention with the in incident contingency for Estonia, for Latvia, for Lithuania through NATO's Baltic air policing. We are also prepared to assist in NATO's air policing in the Black Sea and in Iceland. Nine years after the violent illegal annexation of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol by the Russian Federation, Sweden remains steadfast in our commitment to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Russia must cease its aggression and withdraw its troops from the entire territory of Ukraine. We will never recognize the illegal attempt to annex Ukrainian territories, including Crimea. Crimea remains a priority from an international security perspective, and Sweden confirms our readiness to increase efforts to further strengthen the activities carried out within the framework of the International Crimea Platform with the aim of reversing the illegal annexation of Crimea, including through adopting further restrictive measures against Russia. 
I would like to wrap up by mentioning Russia's extensive attempts to disrupt the states in the Black Sea region. It is clear that Russia is trying to destabilize Moldova and undermine its pro-European government. Increased support to Moldova is crucial for strengthening resilience and for protecting its democracy. Our unity remains our most important asset and we must continue to work together to counter disinformation and attacks on our free democratic societies. Our excellence, ladies and gentlemen, I regret I was not able to be with you in person today and I will shortly have to leave for another engagement, but my ambassador will continue to participate in the remainder of today's conference on my behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Bilstrom. And the next speaker is Madam Maria Pecinovic Buric, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe. Please, you either take the stage or, yeah. We have a choice. <laughs> Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me start with the remark that uh, you, Emina, made at uh, the outset of your introduction, saying that uh, in what relates our umbrella uh, Crimea platform for this conference, uh, that some were skeptical. I can reassure you that the Council of Europe was not skeptical. When the uh, invitation came from uh, Minister Kuleber, I think early 2021, uh, I certainly was one of the first to respond positively. And secondly, uh, when going there, still with the Russian Federation part of the Council of Europe, well, that was a bold thing to do uh, for the Council of Europe. But I had no doubt that uh, uh, whatever, we need to be there and uh, we are very proud to continue to be there. So no skepticism at all, and I'm happy to see Crimean platform evolving. And let me remind that uh, we work on an annual report that uh, takes, uh, we take stock of the human rights situation in the uh, uh, occupied uh, uh, autonomous region of uh, Crimea and the city of Sevastopol, uh, uh, recording what the situa situation is there, and uh, that happens based on different evidence that we can gather, including talking to people who are uh, on, in Crimea. And let me remind you that one of those uh, steps before uh, the, this uh, horrible war of aggression started was that later that year, end of 2021, we together went, uh, and that was yet another uh, confirmation of our support to, to uh, reintegrating Crimea uh, and the city of Sevastopol to our, what are the internationally recognized borders of the Ukraine. We went together to ABL in the Chaplinka, the city, the region of Kherson, and already end of 2021, it was quite clear that getting there was not without a risk. I remember vividly we were flying with a, with a helicopter when we were getting closer there, to there because that was the only way how to do it in one day. And uh, I remember that the helicopter was flying very, very high. So uh, that all was uh, a sign of worrying. Um, Second, you know, the topic of this uh, conference and the main interlocutors are defense uh, experts. And, you know, when the, this invitation came to the Council of Europe, I just thought, well, defense is the only area that is explicitly excluded in, this, uh, uh, in the statute of the Council of Europe, in the Treaty of London, not to be treated by the Council of Europe. But, however, there is an important thing for the Council of Europe to do there, which is security, meaning democratic security, which is integral part of any security uh, uh, in uh, all parts of the world. So uh, let me start with saying that the Council of Europe, of course, promotes democratic security among the member states, uh, including every country around the back Black Sea, uh, apart, obviously, from Russia which we excluded from the organization last year. And let me remind you that uh, we were the first and the only so far, the international organization to have done so. Uh, because of its illegal aggression against Ukraine, 
uh, where together with now our 46 member states, we set European standards in human rights, democracy, and the rule of law to ensure what, again, the statute of the Council of Europe says, the greater unity uh, uh, that in turn underpins peace on our continent. But that peace requires member states to meet the commitments that they have undertaken and which in turn requires political will. Seems very uh, easy when you are saying it, but to get to it, it, uh, uh, it really uh, needs a leadership and commitment uh, for uh, each and every player in the, in the uh, respective countries. So Russia did not lose that will all of a sudden last February. And this is one of the lessons learned, and you referred to it at, the, at your speech, uh, what we learned. We certainly learned that in the future we have to take, uh, uh, take uh, not only note, but to take action before. And actually, uh, really, and that was uh, meant and said by several interlocutors today, starting with Minister Kuleba, with Emine and others, uh, it, it really, this war of aggression started nine years ago, and it continues. So it was uh, taken piece by piece over years. The occupation of Crimea and uh, Sevastopol was one terrible moment uh, in that timeline. The aggression that began last year is certainly the bloodiest. We cannot force now Russia to meet the standards of modern civilization to which uh, its Black Sea neighbors are committed. But we are here to help the neighbors, all those neighbors, so that they can promote democratic security in their own countries and between one another. And I think both are uh, crucial and important. So this includes uh, uh, our specific resolute support for Ukraine, our joint action plan for resilience, recovery, and reconstruction, our efforts to help meet the needs of Ukrainian refugees seeking safety in our other member states, and our determination that the ongoing violence ends, and this is what is important now, in a just peace. And with accountability, someone just mentioned accountability, at its heart. So that is why we are supporting the Ukrainian uh, Prosecutor General investigations into serious human rights violations since early March last year, and why why I have proposed, and now I come to what was one of the lessons learned, to come from the speaking, from the words, to the action. So uh, we are working uh, to set up a register of damage. At this moment, uh, the war is ongoing, but there is, only, there is one thing that we know. There are victims, the victims are falling every day, and we need a victim-centered approach. And this is to have a place where all these people now, here and now, can start depositing the, uh, the, 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 uh, for the damage uh, that was done, for injury or loss. Because if we wait for too long, some of these things that are very important for the accountability, when the moment comes, and uh, it is coming uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, for Russian Federation to pay for what they are doing still, uh, we need to have witness, we have to need an evidence which can be used. And the register would be the first legal step in accountability, and I hope we will have it at our fourth summit of heads of state and government next month. And finally, uh, we uh, hope that this register will pave the way uh, to a compensation mechanism that certainly will only make sense if the second phase, which is a commission for the compensation, and the third, which is the fund, how to nurture uh, the, 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 the compensation mechanism, is uh, established. But that is uh, for the time to come to work on that. Uh, so um, the terrible reality is what uh, is happening in uh, uh, not only in the uh, Rep autonomous Republic of Crimea and city of Sevastopol. Now we have all these things happening all around the place. And I think if there is one lesson learned, is that we need to be aware, we need to speak up, 
We need to go to the places. I was last week in the, in the village of Yagdine, Yagodine, Yagodine, and uh, in the region of Chernikov. And really, I mean, you can read about it, but if you go to the cave where 365 people were held in 200 and square meters for 27 days without the right to get out with a baby of one and a half year, uh, one and a half month old, to elders and 10, 11 of them died uh, over there. Then if you are there, you really see what the Council of Europe, uh, European Convention of, for Human Rights in Article 3 forbids in all conditions during the war and any other, which is prohibiting torture and inhuman and degrading treatment. And what you see there is exactly that. So once you see that, you, if you ever had any doubt about what kind of war, what is the real nature of this war, I think you will, you will then know it for sure. So I think getting to these places, acknowledging the things and working on that, that this war that Ukraine wins this war, I think uh, everyone who have this insight will never, uh, uh, never doubt whether uh, the uh, uh, Crimea or any part of Ukraine has to be part of that. And we all have a war to say and we all have a role to play in that. And I'm sure that from our side we will deliver first thing as uh, this register of damage and continue to work with Ukraine and with all allies and friends as long as it takes to win this war. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria, as well as to your recent visit a couple of weeks ago to Ukraine and your personal reflection on what you've seen there. But while you were talking, we had from someone's phone the alarm, which says that the alarm is over Ukraine with the threat of missile or drone attacks, it's, which is another reminder of that we are in safe here while millions of Ukrainians are not safe there, just in several hundreds of kilometers. The next speaker, I'm happy to announce, Madam, um, Madam Zimtia Müller, who is the uh, Parliamentary State Secretary, Federal Ministry of Defense of Germany. Please, the floor is yours. You either could speak up from the stage or from the place. No, no I'd, I'd like to be, okay. uh, I'd like to remain seated. Uh, thanks for having me. First of all, warm regards from my minister, Boris Pistorius, Defense Minister of Germany. And uh, I'm very happy to uh, be able to represent him here. He's visiting our troops in uh, Mali and, and Niger at the moment. So he's busy, but he sends uh, at the same time his warmest regards. Everybody knows that uh, Germany is a strong supporter of Ukraine um, the, in these war times that we, that we selected and that we chose the side we stand on. And the side is at Ukraine, because Ukraine is not only fighting for themselves, a very heroic war, but it's fighting for, as Peter and also Simona po um, uh, pointed out, um, is fighting for a bigger purpose than the country itself. So it's not only about military action and a war full-scale, full-fledged war in Ukraine. It's about the free world against imperialistic aggression, about an um, empire, a, a self-selected empire to think that it could shape the world to their better. And it's against, or, it's, or is it demo, the, the world of democratic countries, it's the international rules-based orders, international organizations, international law that will in the end live up um, so, and this is why we stand that strong with Ukraine, supporting in different dimensions, in military means, in artillery, air defense, heavy fighting vehicles, engineering such as bridges, equipment training, um, but also standing very strong in, in our alliances so, to support Ukraine on the first step. But of course, it's something much bigger. It's something that Peter mentioned. It's a strong t era for democracy, you said, dem a strong era for a time for democracy and freedom because Ukraine is fighting, that is, uh, is showing that it's worth fighting for, um, for freedom and democracy. So that is something that we can learn and that is why we stand that strong at your side. And in this 
heroic times that we live in, you are really fighting a war and, uh, and standing up for values that we all share and that we all before maybe took for granted quite effortlessly and we now know that we have to do something for it. So talking about lessons learned is not only standing at the side of Ukraine because it's for democracy and freedom in the end for the security of ourselves and the world all that we believe that is the better. It's also about thinking how to, uh, why Ukraine is still supported by a strong community of countries present also for example in this very platform here. Um, my chancellor said it's uh, unity is a value as such because Russia didn't only want to get Ukraine, it wanted to shatter the world order, it wanted to shatter Europe, it wanted to shatter also the unity of the West. So the unity of the West is the value because we stood up together against this aggression, against this, this wish to shape the world order to the Russian perspective. That's why unity is a value. That's for me is one of the, the despite the fact that Peter mentioned um, that Ukraine showed all of us that democracy freedom is worth fighting for and that you can win and stand up against an imperialistic aggression, aggressor. The second lesson for me is that unity is the value as such because only united we can stand against this aggression, only united we can support. The second lesson would be that if we think about democracy and democratic values, about democracies standing together at the side of Ukraine against the aggression of Russia, then it's also that we need to, the support of our publics because we don't, we don't force our publics, we need the support for our actions uh, by our publics. That's why we have to convince, that is why we have to talk about the purpose that was mentioned, we have to talk about values, we have to, we have to convince what democracy, what this freedom is all about and that after decades of peaceful times in Europe, we cannot let this, or this freedom and the security will not be guaranteed effortlessly as it has been maybe before. So this we have to, there, but to do this, we need the support of our public. And the third lesson learned is that, of course, what, what we all have to face, that we need to invest heavily in security that is why um, Senator Scholz, during his speech of Zeitenwende, uh, um, announced a special fund for the Bundeswehr because we all know that now we have to take more responsibility for ourselves because it's not longer, no longer a theoretic threat at our borders. It's a real threat and we have to show that we are able to deter and defend if it is needed, but hopefully never will come true. So then this is where we have to invest, not only in material, also in personnel, also in structures, so that is functioning in the end, that we all come to, uh, to a function, uh, efficient infrastructure and a structure of security, of all the security instruments that we have. That is what we're working on. That's also um, what we have to do at the same time, supporting Ukraine, building uh, train, doing training, doing a lot of material, giving a lot of material to Ukrainian um, armed forces. And at the same time, we have to heavily invest in our Bundeswehr, um, which we do, and to restructure so that we um, fulfill what we to told our NATO allies, what we will, so that we stand up to our responsibility, that we have Ukraine, and that we at the same time guarantee the security for to our people and to all the alliances that we are a member of. So that's our, more or less our lessons learned. And as Chancellor Scholz and all, all our ministers, or the whole government and the majority of the pu German public says, we will stand at the side of Ukraine as long as it takes. Thank you, Zimtia, for your reassurement of strong position and solidarity with Ukraine. And the next and final speaker we go, before we go to the national statements is our Guatemala Foreign Minister, Mr. Mario Bucaro Flores. He will be with us. Your Excellencies, Ministers and Secretary. He will be with us with the pre recorded messages. Your Excellencies, Ministers and Secretaries of Foreign Affairs, Your Excellencies, National Ministers of Defense, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the governments of Ukraine and Romania for the invitation extended to Guatemala to participate in this first Black Sea Conference held in the framework of the International Platform of Crimea.
On behalf of the government of Guatemala, throughout this message, I want to reiterate my country's deep commitment and unrestricted support to the people and the government of Ukraine in the context of the large-scale and unjustified invasion committed by Russia, which has large proportions and implications for the Black Sea region and for the rest of the world. We reaffirm that sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity are fundamental elements of a state, and the unjustified and unprovoked aggression against another state is a violation of the principles held on the Charter of the United Nations. Within the framework of this conference, it is necessary to remember the undoubted need to guarantee fair and impartial accountability for the illegal occupation of Ukraine territory in the Crimea Peninsula and the surrounding waters. It is inconceivable that we're still witnessing the consequences of this war from the illegal annexation by Russia of the territory of Crimea, to the invasion of the rest of the Ukrainian territory, the occupation of the Black Sea territory, and the threat of closing its seaports endangers the world's food security, exposing the Ukrainian people to famine, social destabilization, and a massive immigration due to the invasion that goes against all the established principles on the Charter of the United Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest lessons that we have learned since the Russian invasion of Crimea is that the acts of this invasion constitute a massive violation of human rights and international humanitarian law for which the Russian Federation should be held international accountable. We cannot accept precedents of this kind to be accepted or ignored. In this sense, Guatemala supports the special court to trial the crime of aggression committed by the Russian Federation against Ukraine to an agreement between Ukraine and the United States to be able to make this possible. Also, we want to highlight the need to strengthen the cooperation of the international community to ensure the recovery of the security in the Black Sea and Azov region, guided by the respect of the principles of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and international law. Guatemala, as a state respectful of international law and with deep pacifist vocation, will continue to strongly condemn any attack of aggression that violates international law. We also reiterate our full support for the people of Ukraine, asking everyone to be able to work closely so we can be able to achieve a peaceful agreement as soon as possible and to end this terrible war. Slava Ukraine. Muchísimas gracias. Your Excellencies, Ministers and Secretaries. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Guatemala was one of the bravest countries in Latin America and the first one to actually join the Crimea platform and one of the biggest supporters now of this coordination platform. So very thankful for this uh, strong contribution. And now we have uh, some time for the national statements. We have six those who uh, are asking for that statement and the first one I will in the first floor I will give to Mr. Ilir Tepalena, the ambassador of the Republic of Albania to Romania. Please could you give the microphone to our speaker? Oh. Because I have the four rows, so okay. Okay. To okay, I am very liberal moderator, please do. So as uh, ambassador of Albania in Romania, I have several times uh, the chance to be in this magnificent and historical building for mm, joyful events. But today in this uh, conference, we are far from uh, celebrations. We have rather regrets and uh, lessons learned. Today, we are having lessons learned from a war, from uh, Russia's uh, unprovoked, unjustified aggression against Ukraine. Unfortunately, this war continues to challenge Europe and global security. Everything in the horrible book of crimes is in this aggression. Attacks on civilian and energy-related infrastructure, willful killings, torture, rapes, as well as unlawful transfer and deportation of children. 
reminding us that for as long as there will be authoritarian around, peace should never be taken for granted. This war poses one fundamental question for all of us. What kind of world we want to live in? The current rules-based world order is the one that emerged from the ashes of the Second World War, based on international law, not imposed by anyone, but agreed by free nations, is the one where powerful autocratic regimes would no longer be, fro be free to devour their neighbors, and the one where more democracies than ever have been able to flourish, where free markets and open, and open trade have lifted more uh, people out of poverty. Ladies and gentlemen, Albania has firmly condemned this brutal aggression, which is in the blatant breach of UN Charter and international law. As a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council and as a co-open holder with the United States on Ukraine there, Albania has emphasized the need for the accountability for the crimes committed in Ukraine. Albania was among the 40, uh, among, uh, 42 member states to refer the war in Ukraine to the ICC and we fully endorsed Bucha declaration because war crimes must not be unpunished. We note also that Russia has stepped up its efforts in terms of destabilizing the influence by third actors in the Western Balkan region using hybrid tactics and also elements of common history and religion with the ultimate strategic goal of blocking reforms and derailing Euro-Atlantic integration efforts. In conclusion, I would say that maintaining the dialogue as part of the international Crimea platform is crucial, it's very important. The security situation of the Black Sea and Azov region has serious implication on other regions as well and there is a needed a joint response to end the war in Ukraine and to think about the reconstruction of this country. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, dear speakers. Let me remind you that we have some restrictions in time, so if you deliver your national statement, you don't have more than two minutes, unfortunately. And the next speaker is Mr. Kusti Salm, the Permanent Secretary of the Estonian Defense Ministry. Do you prefer a microphone or the stage? Hello and thank you for the organizers, it's a great event. In Estonia we very often call the Russian aggression against Ukraine existential. We very often call it a historic challenge. But first of all, we of course do it because we have a huge sympathy towards Ukrainian bravery. Um, and it has sparked the desire for freedom in every Estonian and I mean probably in every single country of, uh, in this room. But at the same time, we acknowledge that what's at stake there is not only the front line in Bakhmut. It's also the basic principles that we need to adhere to. What's at stake in Ukraine now is something that needs to go into the dustbin of history. Attacking other nations to achieve your political goal needs to be thrown away. Aggression as a tool needs to be uprooted and this is what we need to stand for and that's why we have conferences like these, that's why we support Ukraine. The policy of sphere of influences is something that does not belong to 2023 and that's what we need to stand for there. And it becomes especially acute knowing that there is a shadow of potential negotiations. There's a shadow of one nation that we know that has uh, attitude. What's mine is mine and what's yours is up for negotiation. We know what's go what, what's, what is going to happen and we need to understand that we cannot tolerate anything that will lead to frozen conflicts or another war. The war in Ukraine has uh, revealed the murderous nation, nature of Russia. It has revealed their bar barbaric actions, imperialism, revanchism, everything. But at the same time, it has also revealed the black, pot, black spots in uh, European defense readiness, in our ammunition stocks, our defense investments. 
and this needs to be remedied. We need to we need it for supporting Ukraine, but we also need to ramp up our own na national defenses because this is incremental, and this falls into the same chapter as our collective efforts in supporting Ukraine. I'm extremely happy that we heard these messages from our greatest allies in Europe, Germany, Lithuania, Romania. Thank you for that. Um, and let's win the war. That's the historic challenge for us. Let's win the war. Thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker is Mr. Frano Matosic, the State Secretary of the Foreign Ministry of Croatia. Thank you, dear Amina, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to commend our Ukrainian and Romanian partners for organizing this important conference. And I'm pleased to note that the last gathering within the framework, international framework, uh, Crimea platform was held in, in Zagreb last October when parliamentary dimension of the platform was launched. So the Russian invasion against Ukraine has brought dramatic implications not only for Ukraine but also for the Europe and the world's security architecture. This conflict is not only about Ukraine. Tomorrow the sovereignty, territorial integrity and independence of any country might be at stake. Effective multilateralism is under threat and it is our duty to protect it. And I agree with all of you who underlined that Ukraine is not only defending its internationally recognized borders and its territory, but also democracy itself and democratic values. So this is, this is very important to, to emphasize also. So Russia actively attempts to destabilize Europe and weaken our unity through hybrid economic and other means. The Black Sea has become the epicenter of Moscow's aggressive and abusive military and hybrid actions. As a maritime country, Croatia understands very well the importance of free navigation. Russian interference also happened in other parts of Europe, especially in the Western Balkans, where Moscow influences economic policy and steers up tensions through propaganda and disinformation. We are aware that the new geopolitical context is is shining a spotlight on European strategic dependencies. The interplay between Russia's aggression and our dependence on fossil fuels, together with the ever-present impact of climate change, has become the force shaping our resilience and defending our strategic autonomy in critical sectors. The interlocked crises have exposed our vulnerabilities and dangers of reliance on one source of supply. Comprehensive mapping out and addressing vulnerabilities to Russian influence and reducing one-sided dependencies is crucial. While Moscow continues with its misleading rhetoric, propaganda and distortion of facts on the ground, we must develop tools to detect assets and disrupt this disinformation campaigns and develop joint standard operating procedures for countering hybrid threats. We have to be prepared for the long-term and sustained support to Ukraine, maintaining unity and coordination of the countries of the democratic world will remain an issue of the highest priority. On our part, Croatia will continue to contribute bilaterally as well as within international efforts to the best of our ability and as long as it takes. At the same time, the failure of Moscow's war plan in Ukraine may also be a lesson for future aggressors Regardless of their military power, the democratic states, the state's borders cannot be changed by force. And finally, speaking also from our own experience, equipment necessarily doesn't win war. People do. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, dear Frano. Please pass our greetings and tremendous gratitude to Prime Minister Plenković for hosting the Parliament Summit. And the next speaker we have is the former ambassador to NATO of Turkey here, today Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Basat Öztürk. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency Emine Cabanova. And uh, it would have been, I think, a big loss if Turkey has not spoken here, which is the longest coastline in the Black Sea, the most powerful navy, second largest army in NATO, 
a NATO member since 1952, and a very influential regional power, not only in the Black Sea, in a wider region. So I think I really appreciate this opportunity that I am able to speak. Uh, talking about values and democracy, uh, my both Minister of Foreign Affairs and Defense Minister could not come here in person because they are now campaigning for a very important election in Turkey. Both presidential and parliamentary elections will take place in one month, but they have sent with me their best regards, greetings, and wishes of success for this conference. And in this context, I should like to start by referring to some of those speakers who mentioned past mistakes. And uh, in fact, we have to admit past mistakes, but they were not fully covered. In fact, the past mistakes include more than what happened in Crimea in 2014, because when chemical weapons were being used in Syria by the regime against its own people, for example, and when red lines were declared and when those red lines were not enforced, it was, I think, a, a, an indication for the whole world. But we have a border with Syria, 911 kilometers of borders. The intervention in Iraq, by the way, for example, the other war after we have all gone to Afghanistan, the largest and longest mission of NATO in Afghanistan for more than 20 years, almost 20 years, but we still go, continue, so I say more than 20 years. We have to remember the Bucharest summit 2008 here in Bucharest. Paragraph six of the same communique was also mentioning about Afghanistan and the linkage of its security with the security of Euro-Atlantic. And we said neither us nor our Afghan partners would ever surrender the country to extremism, even forget about insurgency or terrorism, but uh, the situation is now clear and we tend to forget about it. We pretend that we had never been there, maybe, but it's still there. So we have to deal with all those issues all around us, from Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Africa, everywhere. NATO intervened in Libya in 2011, then abandoned it to its fate. Those allies, some of those allies, who were against the deployment of Turkish troops to Libya, was criticizing us and trying to eject Turkish troops out of Libya and supporting, in fact, those forces, including Wagner in Libya, uh, against us. So this is also another thing which is important to remember. Why I'm saying these things, are they related to Black Sea security? Yes, because the problems are first and foremost stemming from within the alliance, within the European security, defense, and security architecture, because it's not unified. It's exclusive and divisive, still is the case, because the European Union, for example, has adopted a strategic compass, which is not, in fact, equivalent to NATO's strategic concept, which was adopted in Madrid, and I was a negotiator there. In fact, Black Sea has been mentioned as an area of strategic importance, but it was not the only one mentioned there. And Russia was not only identified as one threat, there was another one, terrorism in all these forms and manifestations. Nobody is talking about terrorism. And how can you have a successful Vilnius summit without addressing the second major threat identified by NATO, which is terrorism? But we are also dealing with this scourge of terrorism everywhere, in Syria, in Iraq, and not against Daesh and Qaeda, but also PKK and its extensions. What happens, for example, when Turkey intervenes, let's say, in Syria, in a legitimate manner, the escalation zones, as you know, in Idlib, and to prevent further flux of refugees, migrants to Europe. We are hosting almost 5 million refugees in, in Turkey, but uh, when we had to intervene in Syria, we were sanctioned by our allies, and it continues. We started to help Ukraine long before other allies, including the very famous Bayraktars. But you know, the cameras of these drones are not provided by one ally, which is still refusing to provide them, even under these circumstances. 
even when there is an ongoing war, even there are so many challenges, rising challenges, we are still suffering. So I have just shared these things with you, saying that we try to understand the concerns of our allies. First and foremost, Ukraine, and especially Crimean Tatars. I also have the same descent from Tatars, and then we have a sympathy, but we have 3.2 million Tatars living in Turkey only. And ultimately, we will continue to support Ukraine. We will continue to support all our allies in the Black Sea, but first and foremost, it requires intensive, genuine, comprehensive consultation with us among the Black Sea allies. And then we can look for the future together in a more confident manner. Sorry for being long, but with the longest cost and with those uh, features, I couldn't uh, be less. So I did not do anything. Thank you Pasad very much. Bey, selamlarımızı gönderiniz lütfen. We do recognize an effort of Turkey uh, in the peace broken and also with the grain initiative, which is another challenge in the Black Sea uh, a lot. The next speaker is Ambassador of Japan, Mr. Hiroshi Ueda. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and my friends, ambassadors, on behalf of the Japanese government, I, uh, first of all, I, I'd like to express my appreciation to foreign ministers, uh, different ministers of Ukraine and Romania for organizing, organizing this significant conference on the uh, security of the Black Sea region. Japan consistently supports the sovereignty and territorial integri and integrity of Ukraine, including Crimea. Russia's aggression against Ukraine is an outrage that shakes the very foundations of the international order, including not only in Europe, but also in, in Asia. It should be severely condemned as a violation of international law. Last month, Pr uh, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida vis visited Ukraine, emphasizing solidarity with Ukraine and his determination to defend the free and open international order based on the rule of law through tough sanctions against Russia and strong support for Ukraine. Japan stands with the people of Ukraine who are working hard to defend their homeland from Russian aggression. Japan continues to work in close cooperation with the, the international community to achieve the restoration of peace and reconstruction in Ukraine as soon as possible. Japan have confirmed close co cooperation with both Ukraine and Romania at the summit level. In addition to Prime Minister Kishida's visit to Kyiv last uh, a month, Prime Minister Kishida held a summit meeting with Romanian President Klaus Johannes in Tokyo, and both leaders announced the upgrade grading of bilateral relations to a strategic partnership. Along with support and solidarity with Ukraine, we will also strengthen relations with neighboring countries. The government of Japan is steadily and seamlessly providing a total of approximately 7.6 billion US dollars in assistance to Ukraine and neighboring countries. Ukrainian uh, uh, unilateral attempts to, to change the status quo by force, but such as Russia's invasion of Ukraine, must not be tolerated anywhere in the world. Last week, Foreign Minister Yoshimasa Hayashi attended a NATO foreign ministers meeting and stated that Japan formulated a new national security strategy in the most difficult and complex post-war security environment and that the strategy will strengthen cooperation with NATO and other allies and like-minded countries. Prime Minister Kishida recently announced a new plan for free and open Indo-Pacific FOIP. In the plan, he made it clear that FOIP cooperation will be expanded in order to lead the, the international community, which is at, at a historic turning point toward cooperation rather than division and confrontation. As Russia's aggression against Ukraine is protracted, it is important for the, the international community to respond with unity, and the role of the G7 has never been greater than ever before. Japan holds the G G7 presidency this year. At the G7 Karuizawa Foreign Ministers meeting, 
to be held this weekend, we hope to maintain the unshakable unity of the G7 and demonstrate our determination as the G7 to uphold the international order based on the rule of law. Slava Ukraini. Heroem Slava. Thank you, Ambassador. Indeed, Prime Minister's visit to Ukraine was a very strong signal of support both within G20 and G7 and then his visit to Bucha where Japan delivered generators and those generators really warmed up the whole city of Bucha for several weeks during the blackout. This was really well taken. Thank you, Ambassador, for that humanitarian assistance that your country delivered. The next speaker is uh, Mr. Paolo Cunha Alves, Ambassador of Portugal in Romania. Dear ministers, your excellencies, members of the panel and guests, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for this meeting here, uh, Romania and Ukraine, and also thank the members of the panel for their important contribution. Russia's military aggression against Ukraine marked a profound change in the security and defense paradigm in Europe. For the past 14 months, we have witnessed an attempt to unilaterally redefine the European security architecture and to recreate areas of influence in European soil. The war in Ukraine has had and unfortunately will continue to have far-reaching effects from dealing with the tragic consequences of destruction and the loss of life to responding to humanitarian crises and to major disruptions to key maritime trade routes in the Black Sea, which exacerbates volatilities in food and energy security as well. This reality emphasizes the point that the impact of the current war of aggression is not limited to Ukraine or even to Eastern Europe. It also represents a challenge to Euro-Atlantic security in other geographies and additional domains. As such, what happens in the Black Sea has global repercussions and both short-term and long-term solutions are needed to ensure these consequences can be contained and overcome without further undermining global security and the rules-based international order. While our adversaries seek to undermine post-Cold War gains, we must reinforce our support to neighboring countries and increase the resilience of their democracies and societies. The Kremlin's challenge is a global one, and our response can and should be global. We have the tools for it, and we have the capacity to develop and adapt to new circumstances. This situation demands a collective effort, cooperation towards reinforcing the resilience of countries affected by the war, particularly in the field of food and energy security is critical. The outcome of the war is uncertain, yet we must be clear about what we want, the full respect for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and the restoration of peace and stability in Europe. As an ally, Portugal will actively work to protect and foster the cohesion and solidarity that underpin the Atlantic Alliance. NATO remains the cornerstone of our collective security. Portugal's commitment to this is clear, also and perhaps particularly so in the Black in the Black Sea region, wherein we have reinforced our army's presence with one of the largest contingents of the Portuguese armed forces posted abroad, currently being stationed in Romania. Finally, Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine also showed us that we need a strong and effective rules-based multilateral order. The more some states defy international law, putting us all at risk, the more we must strengthen partnerships among the states who abide by it. However, the implications of the war of aggression initiated by Russia and the speed and strength of our response had consequences which are still difficult to determine. One thing, though, is perfectly clear. 
we share the same destiny and we are stronger when we act together. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. <laughs> Dear colleagues, while we are running out of time, I have three requests more for the national statements, but probably I will give one floor to the Ambassador of Iceland, Mr. Hans Himmerson. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be brief. With the effect of the uh, full-scale Russian invasion in Ukraine being felt globally, Iceland's support for Ukraine is unwavering. The Russian aggression has put the international order to the test. We are faced with the fact that democracy, human rights and the rule of law need to be protected, and these values are worth defending. The stability and security of the Black Sea region is of fundamental importance to our common security. Russia has blatantly violated the European security order. We must, however, remain steadfast in our efforts to safeguard the principles that underpin our freedom. To this end, Ukraine must be provided with all possible support, and we must further deepen our cooperation with, within multilateral organizations. Iceland, currently holding the presidency of the Council of Europe's Committee of Ministers, is firmly focused on delivering for Ukraine at the Reykjavik summit in May, in five weeks' time. In particular, when it comes to ac accountability for Russia's aggression, and I repeat the word accountability. The summit will also be an important milestone to reaffirm our common values on which the Council was founded. For a truly democratic and, and just Europe, we have to address the challenges we face at home, in our backyard and further afield. We must seek innovate, innovative solutions while also remaining steadfast in upholding the values of the post-war regional and international architecture. And uh, we must remember why these in institutions were put up in the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. So with this, I have to close the discussion without Q&A session, which I'm very sorry for that, but it was really crucial to hear the statements of those national and countries uh, relevant. Dear friends, the conclusion I believe that we all came to is that the formula is vision, action, and cohesion. And I believe that the lessons learned will be very important to implement practically with many small and big steps with one goal. So the good guys, as Peter said, will win and good things happen afterwards. Slava Ukraini. Ladies and gentlemen, after this incredible panel, we invite you all for lunch. My colleagues uh, in the room will guide you for, uh, for lunch. Thank you very much. And dear guests, we have a VR exhibition here where you can see the consequences of Russian aggression. And for those who decided to use them somewhere outside, please, can you bring them back to the uh, exhibition? Thank you.
сейчас, сейчас. Doi.
Чистал. Аша. All the photos
έτσι.
Oui, oui. is for France. First of all, the first priority, as everybody knows here in this room, is support the sovereignty of the coastal allies and NATO partner. Uh, in Romania, everybody knows that we participate as a framework nation in the development of the new uh, battalion uh, and next brigade structure, which will be ready in 2025. Uh, that will be discussed, of course, in the Vilnius Senate, and we are preparing as well a uh, the, in, in a reinforcement of the uh, uh, here in the NATO headquarters, which is South East NATO. Of course, we also participate participate to the exercise in uh, the freedom of navigation in the area. Um, I must mention the Sea Shield exercise this year, but also anti-submarine warfare in the Black Sea. We have this Operation Noble Shields with other allies and we significantly contribute and reinforce all these exercise elements, which is crucial uh, to show our poster, which is deterrent. As you know, we are not going to be called belligerents, but it's very important that uh, with our allies, uh, meaning the Dutch, and I thank the director general who just spoke before me, the Luxembourg allies, but as well the Belgium, my uh, Belgium colleague here, we are all part of this uh, deterrence work. Second big objective is to continue the Black Sea Green Initiative, not to let uh, the pressure on Russia alleviated. We have to continue to uh, help Romania, uh, taking exportation of grain uh, through the Romanian ports, but also through the road uh, systems and Ukrainian ports. We are there, of course, to help, as you know. And we have to show the beneficiary states in promoting the uh, Black Sea Grain Initiative in all multilateral fora. Um, next uh, element and almost last element I want to speak of is the structuring project developed in the framework of the Eastern Partnership Economic and Investment Plan. As you know, uh, connectivity will be is crucial in Black Sea. Uh, several projects are being currently developed. A Black Sea submarine electricity cable valued more than 2 billion euro, which could be extended as far as Ukraine and Moldova. Discussion has been uh, going on as well on the Black Sea submarine digital cable with fiber optics valued at 30 to 40 million euros, and also the development of ferry links between Georgia and Romania. The economic investment plan uh, is part of the, what we call the global gateway strategy to strengthen connectivity between the Black Sea region and the EU. Uh, two last remarks, if you accept, Mr. Minister, sorry about being long. In accordance with the strategic compass of the Euro uh, European Union uh, that was set up last year in uh, March, on maritime security, we are working on a maritime EU maritime security strategy and action plan. And I can rely on France so that we include the Black Sea in this new strategy. Uh, everybody's uh, watching us uh, today uh, on all those efforts in Brussels. And at least uh, for France, you can be sure that we will continue all efforts so that all those projects of uh, economic partnership and investment are being taken, uh, including Mr. Minister for the reconstru Reconstruction of Ukraine. Uh, my last remark uh, is about the Moldova summit that is going to be taking place on 1st of June in Chisinau. It's the second summit of the European political community, mentioned as well with uh, a lot of another uh, types of interventions today. It is very, very important in our view because it, re it is an opportunity for the heads of states and government meeting in Kishino to discuss the challenges coming to European continent, to give visibility to Moldova, to give visibility 
to what is at stake in terms of security, in energy, connectivity. And France would like to take this opportunity again to thank uh, the Ukrainian government, the Moldovan government, the Romanian government for all the efforts which has been taken to full support the success uh, on their next summit and for all the participants of this uh, important initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. And I will invite uh, Tadej Nared, who represents the International Parliamentary Assembly of NATO. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me. And thank you for letting me to speak before you. I am Tadej Nared. I am the CEO of Alter Ego, the US-based uh, women-owned cybersecurity and special military tech company. I also serve as chair of the board of Slovenian Ethical Hacker Foundations and also as an advisor to various defense committees and parliamentarians of NATO countries in terms of cybersecurity. Um, first, uh, let me say that I am proud to be engaged with remarkable women, Ukrainian ladies that have set up this groundbreaking company and where we do our utmost and collaborate extensively with US agencies in terms of trying to help Ukraine and its war efforts in actually every manner and capacity at our disposal. Um, I would also like to um, thank you for the interest and all the positive remarks received after yesterday's panel discussion. Uh, as you might have noticed, um, I was not scheduled to speak today, but it seems like the topics raised uh, were recognized as relevant and important, so I'm thankful for the opportunity to reiterate the very pressing issues. Regarding developing situational awareness in the area, I would, as a touted so-called cybersecurity expert, uh, like to point out that in the digital age, cyber is the most crucial vector in regard to developing both ISR, that is intelligence, uh, surveillance and reconnaissance, and as a consequence, situa situational awareness, and we see that in our efforts daily. I must stress out that collaboration is crucial not only between nation states in the region and broader NATO alliance, but that we must learn to trust our own citizen too. As the example of, uh, of Ukraine has shown, it is the unity of heart and minds that prevails in any situation. And as decision makers or as influencers, uh, we should be aware of all the unused capital at our disposal. So firstly, we should increase our own awareness, realize that the war is not a closed circle effort and allow all that want to help to do so. In terms of the cyber sphere, the most crucial component um, where is without a doubt there is the most unused potential. Cyber attacks have become the precursor of kinetic attacks, uh, telltale signs, so to speak, where increased cyber activity and especially the nature, nature of the cyber activities themselves serve as a clear indicator of adversaries' intentions. And we must utilize all the capabilities at our disposal to increase the intelligence gathering in cyberspace, where I, again I reiterate uh, the first notion of unity of hearts and minds. There are thousands of reliable and ethical IT specialists, so-called ethical hackers, that would like and do help with securing our mutual digital landscape. War, in a sense, is a crowd-sourced effort, and cybersecurity should be no exemption to the fact. As a great example of such effort, um, I would like to congratulate Ukraine for developing truly amazing ISR platform, so-called Delta system. 
And uh, I would probably uh, ask you to wrap it up and to let, allow us to move closer to the topic of this panel. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll now turn back to the, to the panel. And I'd like to, to, to get uh, some more thoughts from you on what we can do collectively. Um, and probably you have some ideas on what we, what the international institutions could do in this situation to address the specific challenges. On one hand, we can see that it's very difficult to adjust to these very new circumstances. On the other, on other hand, I think I can use this. On the other hand, we can see how many international institutions, organizations, they really changed the procedures, really changed the decision-making process. We were quite impressed with the recent decision by the European Union to provide Ukraine with one million of, uh, of artillery shells, which, was, which is very important for the situation on the ground. What can we do better collectively? Any thoughts in the panel? And then we'll switch to the floor. Who, who would like to start? I think there's uh, there's a lot to do, and it, it, it depends for sure on, on on the perspective we might see. I would say, from a NATO perspective, as I mentioned, we we have to protect the coast, and we have to make very clear, especially to Russia, that there are no areas of higher or lower priority on the eastern flank of NATO, meaning that the north part of the eastern flank, the Baltic countries, are protected as the Black Sea region. I think we need to emphasize this. And as it was already said, we need to also draw the military conclusions and the military recommendations out of the new strategic concept of NATO. With regard to Ukraine, I think it's important uh, to join forces and really to, to come to the deeds when we say we will support Ukraine as long as it takes. Meaning that uh, spare parts, ammunition, maintenance, those are the critical bottlenecks in, in the military support for Ukraine. And by uh, joining forces, I mean uh, it's necessary to increase our military capacities, especially with regard to ammunition. And when we, when we build factories, for instance, producing ammunition, we need to make sure that on a European level we can all procure from those factories that they, that they could supply all the, all the member states. Let me make one last comment. And on the short run, um, we, with regard to the Black, Black Sea Grain Initiative, uh, we need to, to keep to sustain it. And I, I like to, to express my appreciation both to the United Nations as well as to the government of Turkey uh, with regard to their efforts at least to prolong the Black Sea uh, Crane Initiative for a few months. Uh, but we have to take into account um, Russia will twi try whenever they can to, to extend its war from, from a war by force to a war on food, and we have to be vigilant with that. Thank you. More thoughts here on the panel? Yes, please. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Julian. Uh, of course, uh, I would start, start by saying that uh, every international organization has its own perspective and specificity. From that point of view, I would like to point out that there is a perfect synergy between NATO and the European Union in this regard. First of all, now we witness that the strategic documents that have been recently adopted by both organizations, namely the strategic com concept of NATO adopted in Madrid, and also the strategic compass of the European Union that has been finalized under the French presidency are in perfect synergy. They are looking in one direction and from that point of view we have an action that also is appropriated, mutually complementing and uh, going in the, the, the very same, uh, for, for fulfilling the, the very same goals. Uh, anyhow, the two organizations also have some uh, differences because of uh, the, the specific, uh, um, well, uh, capacity of the organizations to act, uh, we see that uh, the uh, European Union is engaged in uh, sanctions and uh, we have very many packages already adopted, 
I would like to assure you that, uh, well, this is a process that we will follow very closely. We will actively participate in this because this is a powerful tool for helping Ukraine. At the same time, believe me, this is not a very uh, smooth process. This is a difficult one. And uh, there is a uh, difficult process of coordinating the sanctions. Because what is acceptable for one country is not necessarily acceptable for someone else. So it is a complicated procedure, but uh, we succeeded to have uh, many sanctions, sanction packages that are affecting in a very negative way the Russian economy. And uh, this is what European Union is doing really very well. Uh, also, the European Union is very active and very pushy for providing uh, concrete help for Ukraine. And uh, this is uh, something that the Union is doing really very well. Uh, considering NATO, of course, this is uh, the ultimate guarantee for our security. And we can rely on unity there, on perfect synergy among all the countries in order to be sure that the aggressor will be deterred and uh, also uh, that the aggressor will never undertake any step towards uh, further infraction of the international rules ba based order that uh, is affecting our, our countries. And finally, a couple of words about the United Nations. I think that uh, the United Nations, this is the field where the battle is not yet won. This is a very important to consider that many UN member countries are not seeing the situation the same way we see that. So this is a, a, a huge uh, room for improvement, a huge room for our activity for the future in order to persuade all of them that uh, the aggressor is uh, Russia, that Ukraine is defending itself, and the international rules-based order made in this very same green hall of the United Nations in New York that all of us we know uh, is now under threat and is uh, disrupted and, and dismantled by a permanent member of the Security Council that the war in Ukraine is not a European war that is very far from uh, the African countries and from countries from South Asia, or Southeast Asia, Latin America or so, that this is not a job that they are not interested in because all of us we are suffering and the very reason this is the Russian aggression and not the war in Ukraine. Put it in this very neutral way which is, which is really not true. Secretary Foto. Okay. You know, I think that from time to time we have to accept the idea that maybe in the past uh, OS collectively uh, made some mistakes. Uh, uh, look at this paradox. Black Sea is the only region in the world where in the last 31 years we had nine wars. Uh, there is no other region in the world where in, in uh, 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 the last 30, 31 years to be exact, to have so many wars as in the Black Sea, from uh, the, the artificial war of Russia against the Republic of Moldova, the so-called Transnistrian War in, in uh, uh, 1992, up to the last uh, Russian aggression on Ukraine, uh, 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 starting almost one year uh, ago. Why do we, and, and only in the last few, in fact, only in the last one year, you know, uh, uh, taking consideration the NATO summit, you know, uh, the last NATO summit, uh, we in the West speak about the important strategies uh, uh, of, of the Black Sea, because otherwise individually, uh, including countries like Romania, you know, uh, try to to, to draw attention on, on this region for many, many years. Why are we in such a paradoxical situation? Because sometimes I think that in the West we had too much politics and not enough strategy. I think that uh, one thing which we, we have to take seriously in consideration is to uh, give more time and more space in our debates to strategic considerations, because I don't think that it will be possible to move forward and to, to guarantee the interest, the collective interest of the West, our security, our sovereignty, our economic prosperity, without uh, uh, thinking uh, very seriously and very strictly in, in a, also in a strategic uh, way. And the first condition of any strategy adopted by the West is to help Ukraine with whatever we can 
to win this 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 huge confrontation of this huge uh, uh, this war with uh, uh, with uh, Russia. Otherwise, any any discussion about uh, uh, Western or NATO or a strategy on, on the Black Sea will make no sense. The second, uh, I, I think, uh, or the second pillar of, of a possible future strategy should be uh, 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 addressing, you know, correctly or exactly, you know. Uh, the uh, issue of, of, of Russia. For me, it's very difficult to understand how Russia, who is definitely the, 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 uh, uh, the how to say, the uh, source of uh, all our problems, could be uh, 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 considered, you know, or could continue to be considered as a part of the solution too, as it was the case uh, uh, in the uh, past. And, and, and thirdly, uh, I, uh, I totally agree with our uh, Turkish friends. There is no way to marginalize Turkey. There is no way to bypass or to ignore Turkey. Turkey is a country too, too large, too important, you know, too strategically uh, located, connected, you know, to be uh, ignored. And honestly, you know, we may speak about, you know, all sorts of attitudes on Turkey, but I don't think that I've seen anybody in the recent years, you know, try to do that because it will be very, very uh, uh, foolish. Uh, 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 we all understand and we all recognize the importance of, of Turkey, not in the Black Sea, but from a much larger perspective than in the uh, uh, Black Sea. And the best way to move forward, you know, uh, is to work collectively and to act collectively. And I hope that NATO will do that a little bit uh, uh, faster because uh, soon we will have one year since the, the, the uh, NATO Madrid summit. And we are still, you know, far from uh, understanding, and now I, I, I have a personal point of view, uh, uh, to see how the very important statement uh, uh, from the NATO strategic concept of considering Black Sea, uh, 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 sea of uh, strategic importance will be put in practice because uh, 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 words, you know, from our strategic documents are uh, uh, less relevant if they will not be followed by very practical approach. And definitely we need for the Black Sea a very practical approach. The last NATO ship visiting Black Sea, it was in November uh, uh, 2021. 20, I think more than one and a half years ago. If I remember well, it was an American, you know, uh, 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 destroyer. Since that moment, no other uh, 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 NATO ships, of course I'm not including here, you know, ships from Romania, Bulgaria, or NATO, you know, who are uh, NATO repairing countries, who are Black Sea repairing countries. But any, uh, uh, no other uh, uh, NATO uh, country ship, you know, came to visit uh, uh, Black Sea. And I, I think that that is not in, in our uh, strategic advantage. Thank you. Secretary of India. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> of course, uh, uh, we as an organization cannot be compared with uh, uh, big uh, entities uh, like NATO in Europe, but uh, we as an uh, interstate uh, regional framework, uh, with, uh, as a full-fledged organization with all the dimension, political, parliamentary, business and economic, uh, with uh, instruments and mechanism of cooperation are in place. Uh, uh, ready to play uh, a positive, uh, constructive role uh, in the region uh, to promote peace, stability, cooperation in, in that sense. And uh, unfortunately, as I mentioned, all our member states suffer from uh, uh, regional conflicts, from uh, influences, so we are, uh, uh, as, as a country, a uh, club, uh, a bit vulnerable, uh, and we, we don't have uh, uh, sufficient capacities and uh, competencies uh, to address uh, many challenges. What we do is uh, mainly uh, respond to uh, most uh, crying necessity is uh, the transport and transit, uh, which is we, we are facing uh, really enormous uh, challenges in, in that respect since northern routes are, are being blocked. Uh, so we decided why not to uh, address. So the concept uh, as it is was uh, adopted uh, in uh, 2013. It's only after uh, aggression uh, in 2014 of uh, Russia uh, against Ukraine and Eastern border been blocked and uh, Ukraine was cut uh, from uh, access to traditional markets, uh, export markets in Central Asia and uh, far beyond. Uh, then we, we start this uh, dialogue. We uh, developed uh, a concept in uh, terms of reference and now we uh, want to make this as a competitive, stable, secure uh, corridor uh, in compliance with uh, the best uh, with European standards as a part of uh, expanded network uh, 
that is being developed um, uh, by European Union uh, in Eastern neighborhood. So we are offering our cooperation and we, we're ready to do, uh, and uh, we have two flagship initiatives apart from transport corridor. We're also promoting this area as a zone for free trade. We have free trade uh, agreement ratified and in, uh, in force. So, uh, ready for uh, investment, uh, for, for cooperation and implementation of this uh, project. And if I may, uh, I would uh, also refer to the remarks of a distinguished uh, ambassador from, uh, from Turkey. Uh, I understand that uh, probably my uh, intervention somehow uh, prompted uh, with the response. So this is uh, Black Sea, uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, Guam Transport Corridor is in no way it can be seen and viewed as a, some alternative or initiative to bypass Turkey. It's absolutely impossible. Uh, so Turkey is a key vital partner in the region uh, for decades. Uh, and if I can refer to even uh, to the initiative of late uh, uh, President Turgut Azal uh, when uh, uh, he said, pre proposed to est uh, establish Black Sea Economic Cooperation Organization in the headquarters. And that was a, a, an initiative to uh, promote peace, stability, and cooperation. In the, um, unfortunately, due to uh, conflicting interests of the member states, uh, uh, countries uh, did not appreciate that. In the uh, case of Guam, we don't have uh, such conflicting interests. So we. Uh, strategic partners, we geographically located in the sense uh, as a chain uh, connecting uh, Europe and our focus is the Black Sea. So of course, uh, main cargo, main uh, freight uh, uh, goes to, through Turkey, through land for, for now. But uh, as we, uh, I'm from Azerbaijan and uh, in early uh, years of uh, oil field developments when uh, uh, big uh, international oil companies been uh, pondering so uh, after starting exploration what to do with the oil uh, w w where do we have uh, pipelines so and uh, they were saying that happiness uh, is in multiple pipelines in in case of uh, uh, connectivity is also uh, the more uh, connectivity opportunity alternative routes we have in the region the better Turkey will be uh, the main without any of course uh, uh, doubt, but we also, since we're ref uh, referring to the uh, security navigation and maritime uh, in the Black Sea and in the Caspian Sea, I would also um, like to mention. Uh, so we try, try to promote and we now uh, offer to the European Union uh, as a partner, as an interested partner in uh, promoting uh, this initiative and we'll see how it develops. And, uh, in uh, our purpose is to make it as a unified, harmonized uh, uh, area uh, as a single uh, transit uh, uh, corridor uh, with uh, less uh, bureaucracy, border crossing procedures. It's a comprehensive uh, initiative that uh, would require uh, expertise, uh, know-how, and uh, of course financial assistance as well. Thank, Thank you for that clarification. I'm sure it will be appreciated in some portions of the room, that's for sure. Let's uh, switch to remarks and questions from the floor. Those of you who are interested, please uh, identify yourself with, with your hand, just like Hannah Schellest is doing over there, and find the microphone somewhere around you. Is, is the mic on? Yeah? Oh. <laughs> Put it over there. Dr. Shalist, Ukrainian Prism. Um, as we talked about the immediate needs and uh, uh, as the name of this session, I would like to refer to the problems of the sea mines that we have all around and the target not only Ukraine. I'm from Odessa. I hear it each second day, the new mine that is exploded on the shore. Um, Ukraine lost its minesweeper in the beginning of the war. Um, Romania recently had the problems damaged uh, minesweeper. Uh, can we start talking about, for example, European Union maritime mission for the mine sweeping, for the mine security in the Black Sea region with this particular? Uh, if NATO is the problem, uh, European Union already had experience with the maritime missions in Somalia and uh, others. Uh, can we think about European Union as the actor in this case? 
And I'll just build on top of that question. I think we uh, much appreciate the help that we get from individual nations, uh, including many nations present here. Most recent cases with the Netherlands that donated uh, two mine hunters to us. But I think there is a obvious appetite and space for collective effort. Any response here? Any reactions? Please, Secretary. Thank you. First of all, let me say that uh, in Romania, we are addressing this issue very seriously. That's why we are uh, uh, modernizing our counter, uh, although we have countermining capabilities, we also decided to modernize them. Secondly, we are working very well, uh, uh, regionally speaking, with our Bulgarian and Turkish uh, allies on exchanging information and helping each other because freedom of navigation and, and safety of navigation is a common uh, 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 objective for us all. When it comes to EU, uh, I think that. Yes, that's an interesting uh, question, and I think that there is, a, 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 how to say, a, a possibility or an opportunity here for you to continue to enlarge the very important role already played on security issues. And honestly, I've been to Brussels, I think, one month ago. I've been impressed to see how consistent is already the e role played by you when it comes to security. Look, some, I, it, maybe it's a paradox, but on some aspects, EU is helping Ukraine more than NATO is doing, uh, especially because on the one hand, the political will, it was very clear that. Uh, 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 secondly, uh, EU uh, developed very useful tools uh, uh, which can be used uh, uh, on, on dealing with uh, security issues. And now that as, as our uh, 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 friend and, and colleague, French Ambassador, already mentioned, uh, EU is anyway discussing you know, issues related with, with uh, 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 its future maritime uh, 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 strategy, and I think that uh, a security aspect should should uh, should be uh, uh, included. I think at the end of the day, if you ask me, it's only a matter of political will, because because otherwise, technically, I think that EU has everything in place. You know, if we will decide that also to include such such uh, 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 how to say uh, uh, concern, you know, uh, uh, among many others. More thoughts here on the panel. Let's go to the floor. I saw one hand here and another one there. Please. Uh, hello, my name is Andrei Ryzhenko. I'm from Ukraine. Uh, currently, Ukraine controls only 20% of its coastline. This is from Danube River to Dnipro River. And paradox that controlling coastline, Ukraine uh, doesn't control uh, freedom of navigation. Actually, all ports are blocked. Only um, the Grain Initiative allow partially to implement this, uh, uh, this possibility. The rest, 80% of coastline under Russian occupation. Uh, my question, and this is a going to me that it's not enough to control only coastline. As soon as Ukraine, uh, hypothetically, actually liberate coastline, we immediately need to take under control our waters of sovereignty. And this is territorial sea and uh, exclusive economic zone. For this, uh, Ukraine needs to have a fleet. We don't need a big fleet. We need a small maneuverable fleet capable to act within, within, within littoral waters. How you see possibly um, development of this shipping, um, uh, uh, warship initiative, which recently was introduced by Minister Reznikov, uh, how Ukraine can, can take back under control its waters and ensure freedom of navigation. Any thoughts here? Please, Minister. Thank you. Uh, if you allow me to say a couple of words on Turkey, on the mining, and also on the last intervention. First of all, on Turkey, I would like to praise the Turkey for its role. Turkey had, uh, last year, a very successful, exceptional diplomatic year. They did many things to stabilize the region, including by signing with Bulgaria an agreement for using the Turkish gas transportation network. And we are really very grateful because it has not only a very big and important significance for Bulgaria, but for the whole region. Because through Bulgaria, the gas that is provided by Azerbaijan through Turkey can go also to other countries from our region, namely 
Serbia, North Macedonia, of course, Romania. And this enabled us with also capabilities to sign an agreement with Republic of Moldova for cost-free transportation through the Bulgarian gas transmission network through Moldova, which is a stabilizing factor in these difficult times for Kishinev. Next, uh, a couple of words on the mining. Of course, using maritime mm, sea mines is a very cost-efficient way for Russia to control the situation in the Black Sea and uh, uh, on the coast of uh, uh, Ukraine. And uh, we are very much concerned by that because uh, the transportation by sea has no viable alternative for the future. It will remain a very important uh, way of transportation and uh, we have to uh, be aware that uh, full demining of the Black Sea for the future will be necessary in order to restore the normal economic activity in the region. From that point of view, I perceive this situation as a part of the recovery and of uh, reconstruction of Ukraine in the post-war period. Meanwhile, it is difficult to proceed with that. What we do now, this is to eliminate every danger that is coming from uh, the Black Sea areas that are uh, under control of Russia to our coast, as well as Romania also does because Bulgaria has been affected by sea mines coming from Russia, so we are deactivating that, but having in mind that this is very easy to, 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 to trigger these mines by magnetic means, by also radio or by simple touch to uh, another vessel or uh, another, some, some ship, I don't know. This is a military thing. And uh, also about the, uh, the fleet of, of Ukraine for the future. Of course, Ukraine needs a, a fleet that could be uh, a powerful one because the country should be able to defend itself. And uh, this is uh, something uh, kind of uh, an issue that will be, will be tackled in depth when the reconstruction of Ukraine will be uh, at the top of our agenda. We are ready, uh, as a country, we are ready to participate in this reconstruction according to our capabilities. Uh, here I would like to mention, for instance, the restoration of the Ukrainian electrical grid because the grid of uh, Bulgaria is very similar, so we have knowledge, we have expertise, and we can provide, as we are already doing, some uh, means for, for Ukraine to support and to sustain the uh, durability of, of its electrical grid. But uh, about the fleet, of course, we will think in the future, because it's very important, it is crucial for us. Thank you, Minister. Secretary. In Romania, we talked for years about how to modernize our fleet and how large our fleet to be. And what we discovered, you know, after every discussion is that fleet costs money. I remember my friends from the Navy telling me that the, the, the Navy, even when the, 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 uh, the sailors are sleeping, you know, the Navy uh, uh, consumes money because you have, to, you have to, to preserve, you know, the power on, 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 on the ship. So my point is that we need also here maybe a little bit of creativity and we have to, to be careful uh, on how uh, uh, much we use in, in national terms because, yes, all the countries will love to have large fleets, but uh, uh, the budget restrictions are also very clear. And uh, I remember, for instance, with, with, with Bulgaria, we had a, a few discussions in the past, and I, I, I remember that we moved in that direction. Maybe uh, uh, we are not, not at the end of the road yet. Uh, trying to follow the Dutch-Belgian model, you know, of, of uh, cooperating, you know, uh, very well, very beautifully, as long as uh, the, the uh, littoral line 
for, for them uh, is important as their uh, 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 neighbors. So my point is that, uh, uh, and look at the, uh, this, uh, uh, look at how EU is now trying to move forward no? when it comes to the idea of, of revitalizing the defense industry. No country will be able to do, them, to do that uh, for only for themselves. I mean, if we are not uh, uh, cooperating to revitalize our defense industry in the collective way, I think that we will all uh, fail. So my point is that I know that it's not that moment and I know that, that uh, uh, we have to focus our attention on the world. But I, I think that we should consider more and more this idea of cooperating more, you know, to, to protect our coastline, you know, with, with, with uh, 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 Ukraine, uh, Bulgaria, and Turkey, because uh, 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 not only that we are coming closer as countries, but uh, uh, and uh, we are already uh, 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 ready to welcome, for instance, Ukraine uh, in the same organization as us, I mean EU. Uh, we are encouraging also uh, Ukrainians' NATO aspirations. But I think that there is no other uh, uh, way forward, because neither into the future I expect our economies to be so strong to offer us such generous defense budgets, you know, to cover all all our needs, you know, uh, 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 from a national perspective. So I think that, that the only way on the medium and long term to guarantee a, a proper level of security uh, 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 based on our own effort and contribution, you know, to our countries will be more and more to, 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 to work together. And as long as our coastlines are not so long, <laughs> I see no reasons why, you know, Romania should be you not know, to, to stop when it reaches the Bulgarian border and not to continue for that day the patrolling and next day or maybe next week or next month in accordance with whatever will be negotiated. The Bulgarian ship to do the same exactly as the Belgians and the Dutch are cooperating in the north of Europe. And their example, I think, should, should be uh, followed. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Gentlemen over here, and then we'll roll over this side. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 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 I'm a representative of Ministry of Defense of Latvia, uh, Defense Attaché uh, of Latvian Republic uh, to Ukraine and to Moldova. Uh, we know that it was a very successful story about the Green Corridor and about the shipment of uh, grain from the Ukraine. And we know that uh, uh, the Russians, they are also in this uh, agreement and they check all the ships which are go through this Green Corridor. I would like to touch a little bit the topics which was uh, uh, mentioned in the previous uh, uh, the, the panel, uh, discussion panel, the third bullet to win the aggressors. And we know right now that we all expect uh, the offensive actions from Ukrainian armed forces in order to, uh, to defeat the aggressors and to, to, to win the war. Uh, now my question is uh, about the, another corridor, which is operate, I will call it as a red corridor, which is used by Russians in order to sustain in the occupied territory, which goes from Azov Sea from the Kerch Strait and go out, and this corridor is used very hardly. Uh, my question, do you expect any mechanism, the same as for Green Corridor, for expectation of these ships in order to prevent the sustainment of aggressor in the occupied territory? Because I think as long as they use these uh, ships for delivery of goods or for delivery of this, it was announced that some of the, uh, for the material and uh, Ukrainian material and goods was also traveled from the, uh, all, uh, from the Azov Sea. Uh, do you think this mechanism should be activated in order to support Ukraine and minimize the aggressor sustainment capabilities in occupied areas? Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone willing to respond? I'll probably take another question from here and see maybe we'll get some more interest to this topic. I see two hands. Let's do both questions or remarks. Thanks, Mr. The Minister. Uh, I'm the Colonel Parpaillon, the French military attaché in uh, Bucharest for Romania, Republic of Moldova and Bulgaria. It will be uh, just a precision uh, <laughs> regarding the, the fleet, NATO fleet we have in uh, Black Sea. Uh, so we have NATO fleet with Romania, with Bulgaria, with Turkey, and for the other countries, all the fleet from NATO, the last warship was a French one, in fact, in December 21, January 22, uh, the destroyer uh, Auvergne, and uh, 
we have also presence in the uh, uh, eastern flank with uh, uh, ground presence mainly in Romania, <coughs> also in, uh, in Estonia, and uh, all in, the, in uh, all the eastern flank in the uh, in the sky from Finland to to Bulgaria and also in space. Just a precision. Okay, please pass the mic behind you. I expect there will be some comments on the illegal Russian activities. Yeah, um, my name is Jorek Leszek and. Um, I want to make also some comments that we don't just celebrate each other because, yes, the sanctions are working, and, and yes, we do. I think all the countries represented here looking after Ukraine's interests, but also I see there is much more room to cooperate better. You know, I see that some of the talks about EU presence in the Black Sea, etc. This is a, at this point um, a waste of time because we don't have time to waste. We have to look how we can make NATO work faster because. You know, we don't have any more time to get together a new mechanism. It's like we are, we are sitting here right now, 250 kilometers away from here, just off the shore of Romanian waters, there's a ship that is running part of the uh, Russian ghost fleet. You know, it's happening right now, and we have only capacity we have is NATO, and also it's sanctions. Sanctions is hurting Russia. In the long term, they're gonna bankrupt themselves if they go on this route. But these are clever people and they find ways to work around. And I don't think, like, um, in this case, obviously I'm Turkish, so, and I, but I'm just a civilian, but I, obviously maybe I'm not totally uh, partial, but I don't think Turkey is um, uh, consult enough. Like the price cap mechanism passed, very good, but then it created an insurance crisis because I don't think it was coordinated well enough with Ankara. And so like, there is all these issues that we, we are not fully uh, projecting our combined power because we are still lacking to communicate with each other because there is like multiple groups. And um, so uh, that is, uh, and like also like the ambassador has mentioned this, you know, like the pipeline is getting built or refinery, it's still owned by Luke Oil, right? <laughs> So like, and of course, no country should take the burden enough. So like, if it's gonna happen, we need to create mechanism that the countries uh, can be compensated somehow so we can uh, respond better because there is more room we can do for Ukraine. So that's what. Well, th thank you. And I think in the, in the spirit of this soul searching and self-reflection, I would just add that uh, I think to many of us, uh, we were surprised how quickly the war destructed uh, all sorts of economic activities across the region and uh, how this impact quickly became of a global uh, nature. I think there are all signs that Russia will keep this bottleneck blocked or close to blocked. So maybe we are being pushed into finding some other creative alternative solutions, which brings us back to the German comment on connectivity is one of our uh, goals. Maybe there are some ideas of some alternative solutions uh, as we are trying to solve the situation in the, in the Black Sea. So I feel I'm throwing something extra on the plate that you have in front of you. Any thoughts, ideas on all these comments and questions? So, so if, if you allow me, let me, let me make two comments and first of all on on sanctions i believe no one is is naive in a sense of that you believe there is a sanctions package agreed and that's it there are good reasons why we are now negotiating inside the european union the 11th sanctions package because you have always to to evaluate okay how much is the impact of sanctions on the russian economy how much is the impact on your own is it targeted where are loopholes where are circumventions and i can assure you the, 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 we are keeping an eye on that, and whenever we are, we, we are convinced that we could target the Russians more in terms of sanctions, we are willing to do so. You know, I'm representing the largest economy of Europe, and um, the German economy has paid a high price for the sanctions packages, and I can assure you we are willing to continue to do so. Uh, co concerning concerning um, uh, uh, the Black Sea and the freedom of navigation, first of all, I think with regard to the United Nations, and you mentioned it, it's not a chop down, it's a, it's a continued challenge. We need to make clear that it's not something which was given by the Russians and we should be thankful and whatever. Freedom of navigation, the freedom of navigation and the innocent passage of ships is something enshrined in the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Seas. 
and Russia, as a permanent member of the Security Council, bears a special responsibility to respect that convention. We, we should emphasize that on the international level. It's not something where we have to be thankful or grateful that Ukrainian ships with grain on board are allowed uh, to, to, to pass off the Black Sheep. It should be something which is really normal. And that's, that's the point. But at the same time, we need to work on to, 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 to look on alternatives, so to, to, to lower the pressure that Russia can impose with, it, with its war on food. And that means on the short run, we need to increase the capacities of our harbors, of our ports, of, of existing infrastructure projects. And in the mid and long run, uh, as already said a few times in this discussion, we need to work on alternatives. Uh, by land, by sea, we need to increase those capacities, uh, also with respect for, uh, for the time after the Ukrainian victory, so that never ever there is a, is a possibility to, to impose pressure or to, to use coercive instruments uh, in, in, in terms of trade rules. More thoughts? Please, Minister. Just a very brief remark on uh, the uh, naval capabilities of NATO and of the Allies in the Black Sea area. Of course, uh, all of us, we are aware of uh, the limitations by the convention uh, and uh, the difficulty to cross the Turkish Straits for the fleet of NATO. So we have some options and we have to explore other option for increasing this presence by organizing more training activities in the Black Sea, but first and foremost by developing our own capabilities. So the countries like Turkey, like Bulgaria, like Romania, we have to develop our own capabilities and of course in the future Ukraine in order to keep the peace and uh, the international order, the freedom of navigation in the Black Sea. Meanwhile, because this it, it, it does take take long, uh, we have to proceed to develop compensating measures on our land, uh, because this is uh, a way eventually to counter the existing superiority of Russia in the Black Sea area, and uh, this is very important for the topic that we are discussing now. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Um, thank you so much. Um, my name is Hans Peter Mitten. I'm a former Norwegian Navy officer. I'm also a former Defense Attaché to Ukraine and presently a non US Fellow at the Center of Defense Strategies. Um, Earlier today, we touched into NATO and the strategic concept. Strategic concept of 2010 had a very different text than the one implemented last summer. Um, let's, if you look back to 24th February and the time following, had the states across Europe or NATO was unified in a message that Ukraine not being a member of NATO, do not um, have established a right for collective self-defense. All absolutely correct. They all listed core essential task number one of the strategic concept 2010. They've also unified in the sense that they did not mention core essential task number two, which was crisis management. Crisis management, the text on the crisis management and the previous strategic concept was very clear. It said if there is a conflict or threat to war um, which could in any way impact on the security and stability of its member nations, NATO would stop it. It was the basic for several of our operations elsewhere, out of area operations if you like. That very strong and committing text disappeared in the Madrid summit uh, June last year. The question is, can, having stepped back from his commitment, because that's what it is, we, we lowered the level of ambition, instead of 
intervening in a conflict, we decided to step back and deliver non-military means only. Can NATO thereafter have any role in the Black Sea security? Or is that something we need to leave to European Union only once we have stepped back from that commitment? Thank you. And I think this will be our final remark from the floor. mining and demining for the madam over there. Uh, mining to the northern part of the Black Sea has already caused a lot to the whole world, not only the littoral countries. And in NATO books, NATO documentation, there is no 100% clearance of the sea mines. There is always a risk percentage. So the mining will cost more. Just pray, ladies and gentlemen, that Ukraine knows the exact locations of the mines that were laid. Otherwise, say again. Yeah, so. So it is not an issue of EU, NATO, or any other country to sweep away that threat. It is Turkey, Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania have already one of the best mine warfare units in their inventory, believe me. NATO, no, I know it's, it's sad, it's sad for for Ukraine, I, I know. I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell you something, ma'am. We still find mines, floating mines, during coming from World War One. You will have it in the next 15, 20, maybe a century. You know. I'm sorry for that, but that's the truth. Okay. There is no 100 percentage clearance for the mines, sea mines. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I think we have time just for very last round of uh, comments uh, on the uh, uh, on the panel. And I'll ask one question, with a hope for a short answer. If you are to think long term about this region, 10, 20, 30 years ahead, what do you think is the biggest priority? What is your suggestion? What we should focus on? And I want this question to be a bridge to our next and final session, which will be on our long-term strategy. And also, also, I hope this will be a good food for thought for the whole audience when they, after this panel, will go to enjoy tea and coffee. I have my suggestion. I think we need to build what I call sustainable solidarity. I think we have been quite good and decent in terms of these collective efforts right now. I think we must find our ways to convert it into something sustainable long-term. Any thoughts here? Please. I, I would start with a, with a short reply. First of all, I agree. And I hope in 20 or 30 years we will have regional structures, but we should keep in mind what's the necessary precondition, and that is that security in the wider Black Sea region can only be achieved if Russia uh, ends its barbaric war of aggression against Ukraine and withdraw all its troops from the entire territory of Ukra Ukraine. I think. That's important and to, to uh, withdraw it from the internationally recognized borders on land and that was emphasized here in the discussion as well as on water and that's the reason why my country will support Ukraine as long as it takes. Thank you. Minister Milko. Thank you very much. Just in one sentence, what I hope for, but this is not only a hope, but probably a political project to follow Black Sea to be surrounded by NATO and EU members. It doesn't solve automatically everything in the region, but it provides good ground for cohesion, for strategic thinking, and for, and for prosperity for all the countries in the region. Thank you. Secretary FNDU. Uh, from uh, our perspective, we see the future in uh, a new, inclusive, uh, comprehensive 
connectivity and security architecture. Uh, and uh, we as a regional framework uh, would like to contribute uh, uh, to that with uh, our ideas, with uh, also national capacities. I, I think if uh, uh, this area will be uh, a, a transit and development area where uh, the interest of uh, many regional and global players intersects, I think that uh, will, to the extent, uh, ensure uh, that everyone would uh, uh, opt for stability, security in, in this uh, region and, and peace and cooperation. So thank you. Thank you. Secretary Fota. <coughs> Let's follow the Baltic Sea model, which is already a, a Western Sea in the NATO one. So let's make Black Sea also a, a, a Western Sea. Uh, 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 we, uh, and let's use our most important instruments, which we have uh, 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 a membership in EU and in uh, uh, NATO. And uh, I think uh, to reach that objective, let's do whatever we can to help uh, Ukraine and to be on their side because uh, uh, they are fighting not only for themselves but they are fighting for us all and that's that's more than clear so stop Ukraine. well we were instructed to make sure that the audience leaves this panel with some specific ideas to process i hope we have managed well and uh, i will ask audience to join me in thanking uh, my fellow panelists uh, Julian Fota, Nikolai Milko, Altai Fendiev, Tobias Linder, thank you so much for this excellent panel and for this great food of thought. Please enjoy your tea and coffee and be back for the next uh, very exciting session in half an hour at 4 o'clock straight. Please uh, enjoy a coffee break in the same room as uh, the lunch was served. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start our third panel. Please take your seats. 
Thank you.
Okay, so everyone here, and uh, we do appreciate that everyone is still on their places, and you're ready to listen, and you're ready to discuss, and I think that we had like a very intense two days, and uh, we will go straight forward to the session. We will start, as always, from video, which will give a mood, and then I will introduce everyone. Please, video. So my name is Lina Frolova, I'm representing here Center for Defense Strategies and I will be a moderator of this panel and I'm here in double capacity because I'm also representing the expert network of Crimean platform. And uh, I would like to start with the reference of the first to the first panel where the Putin one prof said that we need to acknowledge where we are. And I think that this is one of the biggest problem for political elites now to acknowledge where we are and to understand that we won't wake up tomorrow uh, in the peace uh, situation if we won't work for this. Uh, military often said that hope is not a strategy. I believe so, but I also believe that the dream can be a strategy. And we should have a dream, we should be our like a final destination place. But to make this dream work, we need to have a good planning, how we reach the destination, how we will come there. And uh, together with uh, experts from Expert Network of Crimean Platform, we developed the paper, non-paper, which you all have in your uh, bags, uh, where we put exact our vision for future configuration of security situation. And we try to make it as practical as possible, as big as possible, and as concrete as possible. So we uh, do analyze the situation. We concentrate on the sanctions policy, on, on exact steps which governments can make and which any expert can make to make the peaceful situation and security settlement uh, come here in the Black and Azov Sea region. I just want to name a few of them and uh, then I will leave you uh, hope the um, uh, time to read it by yourself and to think about it. So what we are worried about and what we do recommend to our international partners is first of all to formulate the strategy towards the Black Sea. Black Sea was long enough like a black hole on the European uh, map and we need to come back to it. We need to change the European Union maritime security strategy, which actually mentioned just in one sentence, Ukraine and the Black Sea. We need to have the clear formulation from NATO 
uh, how NATO sees itself in the Black Sea, how NATO sees the development of the capabilities of the Black Sea uh, uh, NATO members and partners. Uh, we uh, put uh, the uh, proposal to establish the joint net naval platform which can include many different initiatives working for freedom of navigation, protection of sea lines communication, the mining coalition. Uh, we also said about the uh, problem of transportation, which uh, Russia actively use uh, to transport the weapons and stolen grains with the civilian uh, ships, and uh, many other actions which can be done to deal with those challenges which we faced. I am absolutely agree uh, with the Minister Kuleba that we need to have a secure place, that we need to have more NATO, more leading countries, and more will of Black Sea nation countries. And I absolutely agree with the Turkish ambassador saying that we need more coordination and interoperability of the Black Sea nations. We need more active voice of Black Sea nations in all the alliances. Um, the only thing before I will give the floor to our uh, uh, distinguished panelists, the only thing I would like to say that um, dreams can come true. We all know this. Uh, just one year ago, no one believed that Ukraine will survive. Then no one believed that Ukraine will have a uh, successful counteroffensive. Now, some politicians still double, uh, doubt that we can release Crimea. I'm telling you that this is Ukrainian dream, and no one can stop Ukrainian dream. And I welcome you to join the, those who can dream and who can implement their dreams. I welcome you to join Ukraine and to join the Black Sea community to make this place a very safe place. Thank you, and let me introduce our distinguished panelists. Ms. Emine Japarova, first deputy foreign minister of Ukraine. Mr. Alexei Reznikov, minister of defense of Ukraine. Bogdan Aurescu, minister of foreign affairs of Romania. Angel Tilvar, minister of national defense of Romania. Niko Popescu, minister of foreign affairs of the Republic of Moldova and Mircea Joana, Deputy Secretary General, NATO. So uh, we have uh, stated that we will discuss the future, we will discuss the strategy and how we see uh, this future and future configuration of the security. Um, so let's, I give the floor for your statements, but I, I ask you to concentrate on strategy, uh, on the ideas how we can strengthen deterrence and defense, how we can reinforce resilience, and how you see uh, the future of this region. Um, Emine, the floor is yours. Thank you, dear Alina. I think that all gentlemen sitting here have agreed to one a little bit ladies first, so I might start my uh, speech, but as you referred to the dream, I actually decided to violate my introductory remarks and to start with my own dream because the Crimea platform is naturally linked with my dream. I remember when in 2014 as a journalist, I traveled Crimea back and forth and I saw with my own eyes what happened on the peninsula while President Putin, when he was asked at the press conference if this was the Russian army to invade the peninsula, he said, no, you can buy the military form in any shop going by, and then he lied to all of us, and we still have the repercussions of these lies up till today. And then when I left the peninsula with my cat, with my daughter, in two cars full of belongings to nowhere, actually to Kiev, this dream of fighting back for my homeland started, and in a couple of years after, the Crimea Platform Initiative was developed on a A4 scratch of paper, and today it is a global uh, format platform that unites over 60 countries and international organizations. And there is one lesson. It is, from one hand, very simple, from, from another hand, not that simple, that teaches us the Crimean lesson is the real peace, not appeasement. And whenever the aggression or the evil is not stopped, it becomes bigger. This is what we saw since 2014 when we all were looking for proper language to talk to Putin or the proper person whom he might talk to, listen to while having Minsk agreements, while having discussions and meetings in different formats. 
But the reality shows that Putin didn't care and 24th of February became yet another stage, yet another aggression act. And today we, we face the war crimes, crimes against humanity and crime of genocide in Ukraine. The first victim of the Crimean occupation was Rishat Tametov. He was a 33-year-old man who was a one-man picket at the Central Square in Simferopol. He was stabbed to death uh, and his body was found in two weeks after, tortured and killed. The first victim of Donbas occupation was Gennady Bilichenko, as my minister referred today in his introductory remarks. He was a captain of the special security, so he was killed by the proxies of Russian FSB, Mr. Girkin, right on the spot. And since that, the whole Donbas occupation started. And I think that at this first panel discussion, we also discussed what kind of lessons we should learn. So the Crimean lesson is the one that we should now be prepared for the decisive actions. And Ukraine is demonstrating the decisive actions by paying the highest price possible, which is the price of our people. There is another lesson, which is a Bucharest lesson, that was in 2008 and April 3rd marked the 15th anniversary of the NATO summit in Bucharest, which was a turning point in modern history. It was an opportunity to take Ukraine and Georgia out of the so-called gray zone. But beneath this optimistic statements about our countries potentially becoming a member of NATO, there was a hidden rejection, in fact, to accept Ukraine and other countries. And in four months after the Bucharest summit, it led to the beginning of Russia's war against Georgia and in six years after the Ukrainian invasion. So Russian occupation of Crimea back in 2014 be became a knockout for the security of the Black Sea region. My next point is about the uh, Black Sea as a militarized zone. We've seen how since 2017 Russia have been uh, blocking the trade vessels that were leaving the Ukrainian ports by stopping them for days and hours. We've seen how Russia has been using the Black Sea as a projection of its military aggression, not only to the regional, to the neighboring countries or to the region, but also to the Middle East. And I think that what we also see is that lack of strategic vision. So like my formula for uh, our common action is vision, action, and cohesion. So really, when we have different strategies of different organizations, dedicated pages of papers on security issues, we cannot escape discussing the Black Sea region and the Azov Sea region, and the Azov Sea has, in fact, turned into an, an inner lake of the Russian Federation. What is the future? I believe that after this vision, it's crucial to, let's say, have coordination platforms or those platforms that would develop certain and concrete acts. We are very grateful to experts who developed a very comprehensive, I would say, paper. So we will really take this paper for our, let's say, work. And we believe that we can travel from country to country in the Black Sea region and also talk to our colleagues by also formalizing this Black Sea cooperation for several reasons. Coastal guard, the demining issue, you know that Ukraine is one of the most polluted countries in the world today with 1,075,000 of square kilometers under mines and it will be a long-term process. So I believe demining might be the first step and Minister Aurescu during our trilateral uh, meeting today with Moldova and Romania has already agree agreed to that demining might be the first step in this future configuration of our practical implementation. So the regional cooperation is really, really important. And to sum up, to wrap up, my personal formula for Ukraine that today is dealing with the war is uh, survival, arrival, survival, revival, and arrival. Our main existential task is to survive. And here we have you, all of your respective countries, without whom we would not be able to resist that long, even though there were very skeptical voices about that we would be able to do that that long. The revival, it will be the infrastructure projects we also discussed today with our colleagues from Moldova and Romania. The next meeting in the trilateral cooperation 
it is very important, and President Zelensky, I think, was made a genius step in kind of putting the effort into the future, because it's also a therapy for Ukrainian people when you not only focus on the repercussions of the war, but you also discuss the future. And as Alina said, there is a hope, and there is still a hope that there will be a future, and discussing this in a very constructive way is yet another therapy, I would say. And arrival. Our dream is to arrive to EU, to NATO, being a part of the family. family. And I, coming from India, I had a two days visit there, while um, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has defined a motto of 20 is one earth, one family, one future. We really believe that everything is interconnected. And we cannot speak about the future of the world without escaping the discussion of Ukraine. So Ukraine is seeking for the membership in both EU and NATO as the only way how we can feel ourselves secured. But we also believe that we can contribute both to the security, economic growth, not only of the region, but also of the globe. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Aurescu, the floor is yours. Well, dear friends, dear colleagues, um, indeed, as Femina just said, we had a very, um, a very good trilateral meeting between uh, Romania, Ukraine, and the Republic of Moldova. Uh, but uh, my colleagues told me that you had very fruitful and meaningful debates. And um, um, one, one conclusion, I think it's, it's quite clear already since um, our discussion in the morning, the security situation is not what we wish for, but paradoxically, the war of uh, Russia also brought some interesting, I would say even positive developments. Because what happened last year was that um, Ukraine and the Republic of Moldova were granted EU candidate status. Georgia was granted the European perspective. Finland just became a NATO ally. Sweden is in the process for becoming one, hopefully very soon, by the Vilnius summit. We also took very important, decisive, crucial decisions to consolidate our deterrence and defense on the eastern flank, including at the Black Sea. We have now a battle group in Romania and in the other countries in the southern part of the eastern flank. Allies, including Romania, have increased their defense expenditures, and we hope for a very important decision to be taken during the Vilnius summit. We accelerated measures for cutting off dependencies from Russia. We consolidated our resilience and the resilience of our partners. Of course, we have to do more about that, but, well, it is already a very important process in that regard. And we have strengthened our unity, including our transatlantic unity. So we are also more determined to defend the rules-based international order and the values the Ukrainian people are fighting so bravely for. All these are developments which were prompted by the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine. So, the global importance of this war and of the peace which will follow this war are extremely clear for all of us. So, what is really important is to become stronger and more united even more. And Romania's top priority, as I mentioned in the morning, is to transform the Black Sea region from an area of conflict and war to an area of peace, stability and prosperity. And indeed the question is how to do it. I will start from the fact that, as I mentioned in the morning, the Black Sea region is important for the Euro-Atlantic security, which is recognized by the NATO strategic concept we adopted last year. But we need to turn these words into reality. First, we need compliance with international law, and this includes the firm policy of non-recognition of Crimea's illegal annexation. And this also includes a decisive fight against impunity, as Emine just mentioned. Second, we need effective deterrence and defense. My colleague, Minister Tilvor, I, I think he will speak about this more than, than I will do. So I will only say this. We need to be able to effectively defend every inch of our territory in, along our borders. And we need to improve maritime and air security, situational awareness, monitoring capabilities. So the Black Sea must be and become a welcoming sea, open, not only to riparian, but also to non littoral states and ships where littoral and non-littoral countries respect the rule of law and can train, can exercise together and ship their goods and energy safely. As we prepare for the Vilnius summit, we need to work for the full implementation of the decisions we have taken in Madrid. 
especially those related to the deterrence and defense posture on the eastern flank, including at the Black Sea. Third, we need to prevent further conflict and project stability, because we have already in our region a lot of protracted conflicts. This uh, current war against Ukraine is a culmination of a state of conflict which is simmering in the region since the demise of the Soviet Union. Protracted conflicts in Georgia, in the Republic of Moldova, in Karabakh or Nagorno-Karabakh, keeping the door closed to their resolution. We have advocated Romania within the European Union to put it more in a more well, prominent place on the agenda of our diplomatic efforts. And we have to stimulate the support and the will of these countries to overcome long-standing animosities and unfreeze the resolution of local conflicts, build lasting peace and security. Fourth, we need to secure long-term long support for building democratic, effective, resilient defense and security systems in the region. And of course, the NATO-EU cooperation is also important in that respect, building on the third NATO-EU joint declaration, which was recently adopted. Fifth, we need to look at other security components. Emine just mentioned demining, but also exploiting energy resources, protecting the energy infrastructure, coping with civilian emergencies, natural disasters. All these are legitimate needs in our region and the international community, NATO, EU, our states can play useful roles in these areas in cooperation with and with the support of the littoral state, including Romania. Six, we need to look at the wider region because Black Sea security is, of course, crucial for Romania, for Bulgaria, for Turkey, the as, well, NATO countries, but also for Moldova, for Georgia, for Armenia, for Azerbaijan, and further afar to Central Asia. <coughs> of course, the Republic of Moldova, as we have discussed today, after Ukraine, the most affected country by the war in Ukraine, and we are doing our best to help. But more help is needed. Kishinev has stood up seeking for candidate status and a stronger partnership with NATO, even if fully respecting their neutral uh, status. We should respond to their orientation with all the support we can, and we have to strengthen their defense capacities and increase their resilience. A stable and secure Black Sea can also offer alternative bridges to Central Asian and Caucasus countries, towards Europe and vice versa. We need to think on a long-term perspective. All these countries are currently under immense pressure. We can help them strengthening their own defense, build viable institutions, increase their resilience, develop trade, energy ties, open our markets to their products as an alternative to selling them to Russia. The agreement for an underway electricity cable from Azerbaijan via Georgia and the Black Sea to Romania and Hungary is an example of what we can do together. And I think perhaps NATO can do more by expanding its defense and capacity building programs to all interested Caucasus and Central Asian countries offering expertise against hybrid tactics, protection of critical infrastructure, of course, respectful of each and every country's specificity, interests, and needs. And last but not least, it is clearly acknowledged that the DNA of the Black Sea security is transatlantic. The US troops are deployed on the Romanian Black Sea shore, keeping the American promise to defend every inch of the alliance. The US Congress and the administration are vested in the security, stability, democracy, and prosperity of the Black Sea. We look forward to the US Black Sea strategy, to which we have contributed to. And we are grateful and ready to continue working together for its implementation. And as I proposed during the Munich Leaders' Meeting, I co-hosted with the Munich Security Conference in Bucharest last November, just before the NATO Foreign Ministerial, for the security of the Black Sea region, we need a transatlantic to-do list. We count on the support of all our partners and allies to frame and to strengthen it. And I'm sure that the valuable insights of the high-level meeting in Bucharest will further contribute to this. Before closing, I want to reiterate our full gratitude to our Ukrainian friends and partners for organizing together this very topical event. And I have the certitude that our discussions today framed our substantial agenda, which approached the most relevant and pressing security threats to the security of the Black Sea region. We discussed a set of priorities to ensure stability and prosperity of the region, and I also want to express gratitude to all of you who have participated here in Bucharest. A stable and prosperous Black Sea region would yield security and economic benefits for the entire Europe, for the Euro-Atlantic region, for the entire world, and I invite all of you to design and contribute to such efforts. 
So thank you once again for your valuable participation in Bucharest. And I'm looking forward to the second edition, hopefully in a, in a war-free Ukraine. In Odessa, I hope so. O Crimea. <laughs> Mr. Reznikov, the floor is yours. Dear ministers, deputy ministers, deputy ministers, colleagues, uh, in order to discuss the future, we should first emphasize where we stand now from the point of view of security architecture. We are facing a completely new reality in this, in this reality. The OSCE, as an international organization, has disappeared off the map. Finland's accession to NATO has de facto put a symbolic end to the history of agreements based on 1975 Helsinki Act. The UN Security Council is currently chaired by a representative of Russia, a terrorist state coming full scale aggression and the genocide of the Ukrainian people. An arrest warrant has been issued by the leader of the Russian terrorist regime for the kidnapping of thousands of Ukrainian children. Nevertheless, Russia holds the right of veto in international affairs. As for me, it's, this is absurd. The aggressor state has weaponized everything. Energy, migrants, food, the cyberspace, religious organizations, the media, its instruments include attacking peaceful cities with missiles and drones to cause a humanitarian catastrophe, jeopardize free navigation, undermining the global food security, using third states at its proxies. The Kremlin has also resorted to open nuclear blackmail, first by capturing nuclear power plants, then by threats of using nuclear weapons or removing them to another country. This is the final nail in the coffin of another component of the current security architecture, nuclear weapons non-proliferation treaties. Let me remind you that according to the Budapest Memorandum, Ukraine has willingly given up the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world in exchange for security guarantees. Let's ask an honest question. After what's happened to us, will anyone ever agree to voluntarily nuclear disarmament? Or is it the opposite? Will they do everything to in their power to get nuclear weapons by any means necessary? The rule of force, not rule of law, is the new model that might take hold in the world. If it's not met with a resistance, Speaking of our region, Russians have tried to seize the island of Tuzla after the Budapest Memorandum. Later, Ukraine's and Sakartvelos road to NATO was blocked at the NATO summit in this amazing capital, Bucharest. That followed by the attack on Sakartvelo after that. That followed was the attack of Ukraine and the occupation of Crimea. This is the result of a flaved policy that includes the following approaches. The paradigm of not provoke the Russians in order to maintain business as usual. Act after the fact, when everything has already happened. Enforce compromises at the cost of the victim of the aggression. These are ideal conditions for an aggression, aggressor. He managed to project, project power and achieve goals while the free world slowly formulated an answer. If a Russian attack will be successful in any level, not just our region, but the world at large will become a very dangerous place indeed. Because this will be a huge temptation for other aggressors. This gives us some clues as to both the general security configuration and concrete steps we need to take. Five bullets. First, we need to change the paradigm. Act fast, act preventively, 
stay a step ahead instead of merely reacting after the fact. We should not be afraid to use force and strong sanctions. Aggressors should recognize that they will not manage to obtain the result, but we will suffer colossal damages. On, the, on this act, day last year, the Ukrainian army, on this day, the Ukrainian army, I mean Ukrainian navy, has hit the cruiser Moscow. Russia has lost a flagship of its navy for the first time in over a century. That was followed by the several operations that had forced Russians to flee the Snake Island to make a goodwill gesture. We have then chased the Russian Navy further away. That allowed us to launch the Grain Initiative. And in this place, I would like to special thanks to Turkey and UNSG for their amazing, outstanding leadership. And no amount of negotiations or begging would have accomplished that. Decisive actions are what gives the Kremlin the right de ideas. Second, we need a system of guarantees that would make aggressor from Russia impossible. It presents there are no alternative to the NATO format. Three countries of the region are already NATO members. There is no alternative to Ukraine's accession to NATO. The Allies' security infrastructure needs to be scaled up to the east. Ukraine has already proven its interoperability. Ukraine has already made its move by formally applying to join NATO. No progress towards this goal just extends the period of uncertainty and risks. Last week, Russia, Russia's border with the NATO has doubled in the length. What did Moscow do in response? Nothing. So we need to act. Third, without the liberation of Crimea and any talk about regional security is nothing more than an illusion. Russia has started by occupying the Sea of Azov before launching its creeping occupation of western part of the Black Sea by blocking areas next to navigation routes for the military exercises. Nobody had provoked the Kremlin. This is just their usual tactic, push until it bends. This is what's at stake with the recent attack on US drone and with missile launches that pose a threat to several countries. Let me remind you that Russia's federal TV channel have called for the capture of sea straits after the earthquake in Turkey. This is the empire's phantom pains. As long as Russia controls Crimea, it will continue trying for an expansion in the imperial spirit. If we want security, stability, and prosperity for the region, Crimea needs to be liberated. This is in, is in our shared best interests. Fourth, some partners maintain then, that matters concerning the region cannot be worked out without involving Russia. We need to recognize honestly that accomplishing a sustainable peace and preconditions for mutual prosperity in the region is impossible without transformation in Russia. Without that transformation, we are just postponing dealing with the problems instead of solving them. Transformation in Russia needs to be an ele element of the agenda. Russia has to receive a clear joint signal. If we will not be able to return to the civilized world without changing, it will not be trusted. Unfailingly, upholding section has to be a part of this signal. Russia has to become a democratic federation. It has to, under ego de denazification, it has to alone. Russia's strategic defeat is evident, but without meaningful transformation, we will not get more than a respite before the next war. Fifth, time is the essence. Prolonging or freezing the war will mean that the progress of the entire region will stall. It will mean lost opportunities. Meanwhile, other will keep marching forward. Ukraine wants to turn the tide on the battlefield this year. The stakes are the highest for us, but it is not our shared best interest. And our army has already proven that this is, this is possible. In order to do so, we need help and we need it as soon as possible. Such a support has to include delivery of weapons and ammunition 
of diverse types, development of resistance sustainment system for Western types equipment, training of Ukrainian military units, increasing the level of exchanging of information on the development of the situation in the region, in the sky and in the sea, strengthening and control of the sanctions regime against the Russians deepening the operational interoperability of the military units of Ukraine and partners' countries. This is the general framework. Framework. Speaking of concrete steps then can be taken fairly fast, I could mention the establishment of permanent acting consultation group on political and defense levels to elaborate joint initiatives aimed in increasingly security in the Azov and Black Sea region, interaction with the framework of maritime strategy of the European Union, applying the environment of data exchange within the framework of the common information sharing environment and participation in the project of the European Defense Agency Maritime Surveillance, taking part in projects of NATO and EU to develop the system of protection for the maritime infrastructure. Years ago, many believed that key would fall within three days followed by Ukraine within a couple of weeks. And yet, we are here now to discuss the future. I have no doubt that the future is a success story. Thank you very much. We will win together. Slava Ukraine. Mr. Tilva, the floor is yours. This uh, panel constitutes the perfect setup for an in-depth and realistic discussion regarding the current security situation in our region and the steps that have to be taken in order to ensure stability in the Black Sea region. The Black Sea is an area where the risk of further severe escalations and aggressive maneuver by Russia remains high. Moscow is using unhindered the Black Sea as a platform to impede freedom of navigation, fueling tensions in the region, including through protracted conflicts, generating gray zones, and creating favorable conditions for transnational security threats. Its main objectives are to maintain regional instability, impact the free will of our partners, in choosing their future while projecting force in the Mediterranean Sea towards the Middle East. After the annexation of Crimea in 2014, the continuous attacks on Ukraine represented an unacceptable signal from Russia Federation regarding the use of force in achieving political and security objectives at the regional level. At the Black Sea, Moscow is determined to acquire domination of the region, preventing and even censoring the Allied defense and deterrence, as well as NATO's freedom of movement, and last but not least, undermining internal stability, coherence, and development of region partners. You are well aware, dear colleagues, of the serious concerns about the evolutions of the security situation in the Black Sea region. We need to choose the right measures in the right format to the right amount and use them as the right time in order to negate the fulfillment of the aggressive objectives and to reinforce the implementation of our own. Moscow's actions are aimed explicitly at its subversion deconstruction and replacement of the post-Cold War international order with a multipolar alternative, an alternative founded on the concepts of geopolitical blocks and spheres of influence. As always, the answer lies in unity of purpose and action. We see the need for a Euro-Atlantic strategy for a stable, secure and prosperous Black Sea. And we think that NATO, EU, and US play a visible, continuous, and consistent role in the region. The war in Ukraine proved that the Black Sea is a critical frontier 
for Europe's new security architecture. For Romania and the entire international community, the borders of Ukraine, Republic of Moldova and Georgia are the ones recognized at international level and we will continue to strongly support their sovereignty and territorial integrity. Romania is today a reliable and valued ally and partner. Romania demonstrates ambition, political will, the ability to contribute to the implementation of common future priorities, including by firmly assuming the role of security provider. As a result of the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine and the, the intensification of security risks facing the Black Sea region, in addition to the defense and deterrence measures taken at the level of the alliance, the Black Sea has become a sample for one of the most pressing challenges we face today. From violations of international law, weaponization of energy, sophisticated hybrid tactics, cyber attacks and disinformation. Having in mind the strategic importance of the region, as it was recognized in the NATO strategic concept and EU strategic compass, it is imperative to ensure a more structured approach with respect to the projects and initiatives in support of security of the region. The current security evolutions have once again showed tremendous importance of the Atl transatlantic relationship, a, re a relationship we have put it at the foundation of our nation's security and defense architecture. It has been a key factor in shaping the modern international system and it remains a vital source of stability and security today. To manage these systemic challenges, we should improve our shared awareness and understanding, boost our resilience and preparedness, and protect our shared values and the rules-based international order. The Black Sea region has been marked by protracted conflicts as well as by risks and challenges of security and economic nature for three decades. The region also holds significant economic potential as the east-west corridor between Europe and Eurasia. That is why Romania and the other stakeholders, including US, should work together to ensure that the Black Sea evolves from an area of conflict and tension into an area of peace, security, cooperation and economic prosperity. We need a sustainable combat ready land presence along NATO's eastern flank, as well as a solid presence of military aircrafts of allied countries patrolling the skies of the Black Sea and ensuring the security of our air airspace. Currently, there are 5,000 troops deployed in Romania under NATO or bilateral arrangements. So, Romania is doing its part for the security of the eastern flank and the Black Sea. And we are steadfast in our commitments and contributions and we support that uh, the major decisions our leaders took last year in Madrid to achieve its full potential. Thank you very much. Mr. Popescu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm probably speaking the 20th time in my life at the National Military Circle, and that's really a, a great pleasure. And here I am today for the trilateral meeting of Moldova, Ukraine, and Romania. We've been coordinating and working closely on a lot of issues on the diplomatic front, on security and defense cooperation, on energy, and I cannot keep but uh, uh, remind myself today that the last time we met in the trilateral format was in uh, Odessa in September and our joint press conference with Bogdan and Dmitro ended under uh, air sirens because there was an impending attack. I think we, we had around 10-15 minutes of our press conference under air sirens and I remember looking at Dmitro and as long as he was calm, I was calm and Bogdan was calm. 
But then the true depression and concern hit me when Bogdan and I started driving back to Moldova and we knew that our friends and partners and Mitro and his colleagues had to stay under air sirens, under bombings, and that's truly something that we uh, all feel uh, very uh, closely to our hearts. And uh, by starting this, I can tell you, and even this small um, instance of our trilateral dialogue also reminds us that uh, what Ukraine is growing through is an incredible tragedy of enormous proportions, and nothing compares to that. Uh, but Moldova as a country next to Ukraine with not a lot of capabilities uh, has been there uh, severely affected by this war. And after Ukraine being one of the countries where the impact of the war has been the most dramatic on our country's security, on our country's economy, on our country's energy security, on our cyber security, on our everything. Every single domain in Moldova has been negatively affected by this war and every single person living on the territory of Moldova has been negatively affected by this war. Uh, however, we have managed to cope reasonably well given the circumstances with the last year and you know, the list of the negative impact of the war on Moldova is, is very long. I can give you numbers upon numbers. We've had 30 plus percent inflation, the gas prices for the population went up seven times, electricity prices went up four times, etc., etc. But we did manage to cope. With the last year, we have managed to keep stability and calm and uh, the economic resilience of our country has been reasonably good despite these shocks. And that we have managed to do primarily thanks to Ukraine. As we speak today, Moldova is not facing immediate military risks. And this is because of Ukraine. It's because of the Ukrainian people, it's because of the Ukrainian army, it's because of the Ukrainian society and political system, which have kept the Russian tanks away from our border and has allowed Moldova to benefit from peace, calm and stability. And a certain ability to deal with the other threats we're facing. And of course, in this series of threats, Moldova has long been a primary target of Russian hybrid war tactics deployed against Moldova. Uh, some of them have been started to being deployed even before our independence, Russian uh, support for separatism, uh, you know, a Russian TV program about Moldova in 1990 or 91 is roughly has the same tone and the same amount of toxic propaganda against us as you would have today on Russian TV. So some of those tactics we have been living on with for a long time, but of course in the last year they have increased uh, exponentially. Uh, as I said, though, we have managed to keep violence away from our streets, our uh, intelligence services, police, the Defense Ministry has worked uh, incredibly well to make sure that violence is kept away from uh, Moldova, that our functionality as a country, as a society, as an economy stays uh, solid. And that is something which also allowed us to concentrate and together with Ukraine to engage in this deepening and accelerated uh, road of accession to the European Union. So if we are trying to look ahead, uh, for Moldova, the immediate goals is along with Ukraine is to accelerate, deepen and intensify all our links in all domains with those countries and institutions that support Moldovan liberty, Moldovan democracy and Moldovan Europeanness. And here, of course, I mean Romania, first and foremost, you know that we share a culture, a history, a language and a common future in the European family. Uh, and we've been working really very closely with Romania to make sure that Moldova's attachment and integration with Europe is irreversible. But besides Romania, of course, we've been very work closely working with all the countries, as I said, that support us and institutions. And that in includes the European Union, NATO, who have really done an amazing job in supporting us through this last year. And here, Mircea Joan and I are also reg regularly meeting on all kinds of platforms in Brussels and other cities to make sure that we deepen our cooperation. And that has been going uh, reasonably well. 
we are on track to making significant progress this year towards EU accession. We're also engaged in several concrete ways of uh, strengthening our security and defense cooperation through the European Union, with the European Union, with the EU member states. Just in the next few weeks, we will have uh, several announcements becoming finalized and public. In a few weeks, the European Union will launch a CSDP civilian mission to Moldova. We'll announce a package of sanctions, hopefully, which will be targeting those oligarchs that uh, work together with Russia to destabilize Moldova and to bring violence on our streets. And through the European uh, Peace Facility, Moldova has been, along with Ukraine, a great beneficiary of European military assistance, which allows us to strengthen our capacity to, peace, to keep peace and calm on our territory. Having said that, I will probably end here. That would allow us for more uh, time to interact through questions and answers. And our plan for the immediate future on the diplomatic, on the political, on the strategic front is to continue standing by Ukraine showing all solidarity and all support that we can give to Ukraine and being, as I said, thankful and grateful for the sacrifice uh, that Ukraine is uh, taking in defending itself, but also by doing so in defending Moldova. And we, as I said, are uh, engaged in this fastening and deepening of our integration with, uh, with EU institutions and countries. And by doing so, we know we are not alone. We know we have dozens of states we can count uh, on. Uh, sometimes we have this joke with Bogdan that uh, Moldova has two foreign ministers and that's, I think, the, the best example of the degree of our coordination and integration. And this is the road ahead for us. And by doing this together, we will be able to keep uh, the peace, the stability, and the European Union of our country. Thank you. Mr. Chan, the floor is yours. No one wants to take this one. Uh, thank you so much, Alina, and uh, it's good to be back home. This place that symbolizes Romania's national identity and, and the sacrifice over generations and historical periods to be finally part of the West. I had a long and interesting discussion with my friend uh, Oleksiy Resnikov earlier. And I also uh, was a physical participant and contributor to the launch of the Crimean platform in August 2021 in Kiev. And I was a little bit puzzled why I was invited as a NATO representative to speak last. And I asked President Zelensky and Dmitry Kuleba why did we invite NATO to speak last? Is that a message? And with this uh, exceptional humor and wisdom, the president, the foreign minister, told me the guy that speaks last will have the most lasting impact on the audience. Let's hope this will be the case also in Bucharest. The day after the Crimean platform launch, and by the way, I was impressed by the leader of the Crimean Tartars, an old gentleman, dignified and heroic, and also telling us that if we allow an imperialistic power to grab by force territory from an independent nation, we are doomed for this scenario to happen not only in Europe but elsewhere. What happens in Europe can also happen in Asia. What happens in the Black Sea could happen tomorrow if we don't do things right now and here in another sea and ocean, in the Pacific, or wherever else. The day after the Crimean platform launch, I attended the 30th anniversary of the independence of Ukraine. I really remember the big square, and also men were wearing E, as we said them in Romanian. And I asked the day before President Zelensky, so Mr. President, when are you going to respond to the infamous long essay by President Putin? I think that is still on the website of the Kremlin. And basically, he denies the national identity and culture of Ukraine. 
And he smiled and he said, listen to my speech tomorrow. I listened to his speech on the 30th anniversary of Ukraine. And I heard a leader of a proud nation anticipating probably trouble to come with a sense of national identity and resilience and hunger for a better future. That is probably the explanation of the heroism that we see with our Ukrainian friends in this difficult, difficult, barbaric war. We are living in a world which is competitive and dangerous. And this is not only because of this war, it's also because of the global shift and great power competition. A competition defined by a fight between democracies and authoritarian regimes. The Black Sea region is at the heart of today's discussion. And as a Romanian, I also know and I feel that this is a region which is strategically important area for Euro-Atlantic security. Of course, for the riparian states, but also as a platform, a springboard for Russia to project power to Africa, to the Middle East, in what we call in NATO a 360 degree approach. So what happens in the Black Sea is not only for the Black Sea only, is also for the Mediterranean Sea, for the Adriatic Sea, for the Indian Ocean, and beyond. The Black Sea region has been the focus of Russia's aggressive build-up and actions for more than two decades now. And the illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014 and the portions of the Donbass were just, if you want, a startup. This is also influencing the Western Balkans. This is influencing also our Georgian friends. It's influencing our Moldovan friends. It's influencing our friends in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And this is why Russia's irresponsible and hostile behavior in the broader Black Sea region is deeply affecting the security of the entire alliance. So when in Madrid last year when our leaders approved the strategic concept saying the strategic importance of the Black Sea, this is not just a piece of paper. This is a fundamental belief and action by our alliance. We stepped up our presence in the region since 2014. We enhanced our cooperation partnership with Ukraine. And this is why our footprint after the full-blown war by Russia is increasing. I would like to thank our French and Italian allies for leading the two battle groups in Romania and Bulgaria. And of course, to our allies in Turkey for the immense role that they play in a much broader region. We have now four more new battle groups and we'll be bringing them up to brigade level as needed. And also encouraging prepositioning of equipment and also multi-domain operations because it's not only about sea, land and air but also about cyberspace and space. We continue and we will continue to support Ukraine. We have stood by Ukraine since the independence of this country back in 1991. Over the last year, allies have provided unprecedented support for Ukraine's right to self-defense. With 65 billion euros of military aid, and Oleksiy and his colleague in Ministry of Defense know that this is going to continue. NATO will stand by Ukraine for as long as it takes and will support your long-term path to Euro-Atlantic integration. And as a Romanian and a foreign minister of this country who has the privilege to raise the flag of my country as a new NATO member back in 19 years ago already and seeing our Finnish new allies and our Swedish new allies joining our ranks, I know that you belong to the West, you belong to the family of democracies 
You belong to the Euro-Atlantic family. And we are standing with you all the way. We also have increased our support to other partners at risk of Russian aggression, including for the Republic of Moldova. And I salute Nicu Popescu, a brilliant diplomat and leader. But our friends in Georgia, they are an enhanced opportunity partner to NATO, and we are looking forward to continuing to invest in our partnership. And I wish you the best of luck also on the EU front, because this is also very important for you, together with Ukraine and the Republic of Moldova, to go towards Europe. Nico Popescu remembers that when you visited NATO HQ earlier this year, and also some of your colleagues, we discussed how to deepen our cooperation with full respect for Moldova's independence, sovereignty, territorial integrity, and constitutional neutrality. I welcome the partnership we have both to NATO and the EU, and I encourage the Republic of Moldova to make even better use of this joint partnership between NATO, EU, and the Republic of Moldova. There is more synergy to be identified and more things we can do and will do together. Your neutrality does not mean we cannot work together with NATO. On the contrary, NATO is stepping up political and practical support to Moldova through an enhanced capacity building package. We support your political aspirations to join the West and also to increase your national resilience. Because resilience is crucial, is multifaceted, sometimes it has explicit aggressive behavior, sometimes more implicit and insidious facets. Russia is using all the conventional and hybrid tools in its toolbox. And the Republic of Moldova is the place where Russia is fooling to its fullest extent the toolbox of hybrid warfare against your country. In order to hamper economic development and foment instability in the region. So we need to strengthen our individual and collective resilience to withstand any threats and challenges from conventional to cyber attacks to disinformation and attempts to interfere in our democracies and economies. We can learn much from one another amongst allies and partners, building up stronger societies and more resilient critical infrastructures in a team effort. Recently, NATO and the EU, our Secretary General and President von der Leyen, will establish a joint task force on critical infrastructure. And I encourage the countries in the Black Sea region to co-opt and be active in this new format because of the Black Sea has critical infrastructures we need to protect, defend, and make sure that they work to the benefit of our people. So we look forward to working with all of you as we head towards our next summit in Vilnius in July. We look forward to welcoming Dmitry Kuleba, Oleksii to our ministerial meetings. Niku, if you want to be again like you have been in Bucharest for the foreign ministers meeting that Bogdan has hosted, I think a few months back, you are always welcome amongst our ranks. And of course, we look forward to welcoming President Zelensky at the NATO summit in Vilnius in mid-July. So in this temple of Romanian national identity and struggle over generations to become part of the political, democratic, and hopefully prosperous West, I send you our best message of hope. We'll stay with Ukraine for the long haul. And the place of all these independent nations, from Georgia to Moldova, from Ukraine to Bosnia, and to any other democracy in Europe, if you choose so, to be with the Euro-Atlantic family, this dream will come true. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Before we come to discussion, in accordance with our traditions here, we uh, give the floor for short statements for our country partner representatives. And we will start with Mr. Lasha Darsalia, first Deputy Minister of the Foreign Affairs, Georgia. Thank you, Your Excellencies, uh, dear ministers, dear colleagues, distinguished attendees, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor of mine to address the first Plexi Security Conference in the framework of Crimea platform. I express my sincere gratitude to His Excellency Foreign Minister Kuleba and His Excellency Foreign Minister Aurescu for this important initiative, which is extremely timely in such extraordinary circumstances for Euro-Atlantic security. For more than a year now, we have been witnessing Russia's unprovoked and unjustified war of aggression against Ukraine. The scale and devastation of the war, we have severe, uh, war have severely impacted nearly all aspects of, foreign secu uh, of regional security. A terrible year of brutal hostilities has taught us many invaluable lessons we are obliged to learn carefully. The war in Ukraine has demonstrated the necessity of having a firm and consistent strategy on the wider Black Sea security. Bearing in mind the strategic significance of the Black Sea region, for years we had been advocating for enhanced Western engagement in the region and the development of a consistent strategic approach towards this contested flank of Euro-Atlantic space. Accordingly, we welcome the bolstered NATO and the US presence in the region and the Allied decision to recognize the Black Sea as a strategically important region for the Alliance in NATO Strategic Concept 2022. However, more has to be done. The time is now for NATO to make a long delayed decision and adopt a comprehensive strategy for the wider Black Sea region. The strategy should address regional security in all the relevant domains and envisage concrete actions. We believe that strategy should aim to develop joint mechanisms for the effective tackling of disinformation campaigns, strengthening national cyber security systems, improving communication and transportation systems, and protecting critical infrastructure. At the same time, the EU needs to address the wider Black Sea region uh, from the economic and energy security perspective. Today, Europe is in urgent need of the diversification of economic and energy sources. And since the Black Sea region represents a historic transit route between Europe and Asia, it has to be transformed into a major transit hub for supply from Central Asia to Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, the strengthened security of the, Black, uh, of the wider Black Sea region is a guarantee of peace and stability in the whole Euro-Atlantic area. We should spare no effort to make the region functional again. In the new security architecture that shall be created after the restoration of territorial integrity of U Ukraine and other regional states, the wider Black Sea region should be acknowledged under the common security umbrella of the international, uh, international uh, liberal Western order. Another major lesson uh, the recent history has taught us is that peace and security in our region are achievable only under the collective defense umbrella. Therefore, the best policy to ensure persistent deterrence and defense in the entire Euro-Atlantic area, including the Black Sea region, is full political integration of countries like Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova, genuinely European nations into European and respectively into Euro-Atlantic family. And finally, let me express my sincere gratitude to Romanian side for hosting us today and the Ukrainian side as a co-hosts. Thank you very much and Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Um, Slava, Diakon. Um, representative of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, United Kingdom, Mr. Andrew Ford. Good afternoon, Excellencies, Ministers, Representatives. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here on behalf of the United Kingdom. We are very grateful to Ukraine and Romania for organizing and hosting this conference. And we welcome the chance to join colleagues today for this important discussion. The UK, the UK stands with Ukraine and will continue to do so for as long as it takes. 
for Ukraine to prevail against Russia's assault on their sovereignty and territorial integrity. We'll do it with continuing military aid, training, humanitarian assistance, political support, and by helping mobilize the international community. For the UK and the international community must and do stand against Russia's naked aggression and for freedom, democracy, and the sovereignty of nations around the world in compliance with the UN Charter and the rules-based international system. We are learning lessons at a national level. I want to take every opportunity, such as this, to learn internationally along with our allies, partners, and friends. The UK government has recently updated its international strategy to take account of Russia's latest invasion of Ukraine and of an increasingly contested wider world. The review confirms that our most pressing foreign policy priority is indeed to address the threat posed by Russia to European security. Our conclusion is that democracies like ours must go further together to out-cooperate and out-compete states that are driving instability in order to uphold the stability, security, and prosperity of our continent and the Euro-Atlantic area as a whole. The UK is proud of the support we have given Ukraine, but military assistance, sanctions, and humanitarian aid are not enough. For when this war is over, we must never again allow Ukraine to be left vulnerable to attack. We must together make sure that Ukraine, its regional neighborhood, and all countries in the Euro-Atlantic area are safe and secure and able to thrive economically. That is why, for example, among other things, the UK is already supporting Ukrainian capacity building in maritime demining. That is why the UK is pleased to co-host the Ukraine Recovery Conference in London in June of this year, to mobilize the combined might of public and private finance to ensure that Ukraine gets the reconstruction investment that it needs. Beyond the NATO framework, the UK is also privileged to enjoy strategic partnerships with many countries represented here from around the Black Sea region. We will continue to deepen these partnerships, refreshing and updating those that we have and seeking opportunities to form new ones. Our first task is to support Ukraine to win the war and to recover from it. But thereafter, we must be ready with allies and partners to help modernize, maintain and support future Euro-Atlantic security into the longer term. While delivering significant support to Ukraine and bilaterally and via NATO tailored support packages to other countries in the Black Sea region affected by Russia's aggression, we also have much to learn from our partners, especially about national resilience. To close, let me return to lessons. We're all already learning many political, economic, energy security and wider security lessons from this conflict and will be doubtless doing so for years to come as a future European security order becomes clearer. This conference is visible public acknowledgement of that. The breadth, depth and ingenuity of ideas and proposals that we've heard today enriches that learning process and offers much food for further thought. However, the biggest lesson, surely, must be for the Kremlin. We must all do what we can for as long as necessary for Russia to learn that mounting an unprovoked, premeditated, illegal and barbaric assault against a sovereign democratic state was wrong. That it was and continues to be a huge strategic mistake. And above all, that it has not and will not succeed. Thank you. Thank you. George Radulovic, Foreign Policy Advisor to the Prime Minister of Montenegro.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I start, I would like to say how thankful we are for organizing to the ministries of defense and foreign affairs of Romania and Ukraine for organizing this important event dealing with Black Sea region security that has enormous importance also far beyond this region and even the Western Balkans. So more than a year has passed since the beginning of the relentless Russian aggression against Ukraine. One year since the Ukrainian people started a decisive struggle for the defense of its country and showed the strength of, of their courage and heroic fight to preserve the dignity of the country, the peace and freedom of Europe, the unity of the democratic world and the values we strive for together. The security of the Black Sea is an issue that concerns not only a coastal countries, riparian states, but the whole world. Thus, the Black Sea enhances geopolitical and economic competition at a global level and also adds a new dimension to the Euro Atlantic security system. The situation in the Black Sea did not change overnight. For many years, Russia has been trying to stir up and to militarize this region. The Russian occupation of Crimea and full scale invasion of Ukraine only exacerbated this threat. Russia's continued activities in this region have serious implications for the European security. In response, the West, political West, we, must develop a comprehensive strategy to secure the long-term future of the Black Sea region. In the light of Russian aggression against Ukraine, we have an obligation as a part of countries to coordinate and contribute to the defense of Ukraine's internationally recognized rights and not allow Russia to continue abusing Black Sea region by its illegitimate actions. Russia has been trying from the very beginning of its aggression to reduce NATO's presence on its eastern borders. But on the other hand, NATO has shown the strengthening of its role and the creation of a new sense of the alliance existence. This is evidenced also by the decision of Sweden and Finland to join the alliance, as well as Ukraine's application for accelerated membership. Through such events, the recognized need to preserve and build reliable and safe architecture of the future world is clearly visible. Today at this conference, Montenegro confirms its unequivocal support for Ukraine in its struggle to secure its integrity and sovereignty. This is obligation for all of us. Not only that, it's our moral responsibility and the proof of our full dedication to reaching these goals. From the very beginning of the Russian invasion to Ukraine, Montenegro has shown solidarity with Ukraine and its people in the fight to defend the highest postulates of the international law, both bilaterally by sending military, humanitarian and material aid, aid and internationally condemning by condemning all actions of Russia that in any way encroach on the sovereignty and integrity of this country. In such manner, Montenegro will continue in coordination with, with the allies to support Ukraine in its path to freedom, well-being and secure future as well as, as well as its efforts to become a full member of the large European and Euro-Atlantic family to which Ukraine belongs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Julian Kifo, Foreign Policy Advisor to the Romanian Prime Minister. Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, dear ambassadors, Thank you very much first for inviting me here at the conference and allow me uh, to congratulate in the name of the Romanian Prime Minister, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Defense, my good friend Alina Frolova for putting together this conference uh, based on uh, Crimea platform. Here in Bucharest it's a good place, I'm quite sure that we all agree, for exchange of ideas, for the debates, for the consistency of what we need to do also in the future. And since it's about the future in that particular panel, allow me also to make three points related to what is now going on. Discussing about the future, we are always looking to criteria, to indicators, to what is happening. And for the short and midterm, we should look at three plus one conditions. The first one is for sure, the resilience of Ukraine and of the Ukrainians. In the first line, but also behind the lines, the Ukrainian citizens who are supporting the war efforts. 
The second one is the resilience of the West. Resilience in supporting financially, in supporting militarily, in supporting humanitarianly. The effort that Ukraine is doing those days in the full-scale war of Russia against uh, its own territory, citizens, and independence. The third point would be the capacity of Ukraine to absorb, actually, the, let's call it the spring attack of the Russians, and to reply, because actually it needs to have its own counter uh, offensive. As we are seeing up to today, they are managing quite well and we are looking forward to see the evolutions in the next month to come. And I have a plus one which is related to Russia, Putin's Russia. The capacity of Putin of maintaining the vertical of power, the system. We all know that in an autocracy any little trigger can, can bring down, can lead to the implosion of such an actor. The second point is about the end of the war, actually about the condition, the conditions at the end of the war. So we have a first condition which is that Ukraine should win, Russia should lose. If not, we are creating a precedent how a country can take parts of the territory of its neighbor. The second point is the fact that Russia needs to pay it needs to pay in terms of creating the war, destruction, so it needs to, the, the whole Ukraine needs to be rebuilt. It needs to pay in terms of war crimes. It needs to pay also, and we already learned the lessons after the Second World War, in terms of never coming back to use the war in solving international relations, objectives, or excessive levels of ambition. And the third point comes for our citizens. All our citizens have made an extreme effort to support the war in terms of prices, inflation, support for the war in Ukraine. And it happens so because all of us, we would like to have our children, grandchildren, living in such, well, unperfectional uh, democracy, but to have a choice, not to live under a type of Putin that tells them what to do. But it comes with costs, costs for the officials, for the decision makers. It comes with the cost that all people, companies, countries that are helping now Russia to avoid the sanction should pay. My third point is about what we already know that will happen after the war. First, Crimea platform. I think that we already have the symbol for a platform for all Russian illegally annexed territories, because it's not only about Crimea nowadays, unfortunately. The second point, what you are seeing is the fact that the weight, the strategic weight, moves in Europe Eastern. And it will happen for the foreseeable future, since the security in Europe is not settled. And the third point, after the lessons learned of the Budapest Memorandum, actually, I don't think that we can think at any other type of warranty for Ukraine, for Ukraine security, territorial integrity, sovereignty, independence, except NATO accession. So, these are facts. Thank you very much, and uh, I wish you also the best on your return home. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ambassador of Italy, Alfredo Maria Durante Mangoni. Dear ministers, excellencies, esteemed guests, as we draw near to the 14th month of Russia's brutal and unprovoked aggression, let me highlight that Italy continues to stand firm and unwavering in its support for Ukraine, its territorial integrity and sovereignty, its independence and freedom, its resilience, its recovery and future reconstruction. Let me also highlight in the strongest, clearest possible terms, Crimea is Ukraine. 
The Russian Federation's illegal annexation of the peninsula in March 2014 remains a grave and unacceptable violation of key and universal principles of international law that underpin the peaceful coexistence among states and peoples. Since then, Italy, in close coordination with all partners and allies, continues to constantly and consistently condemn Russia's illegal actions in all possible occasions and relevant fora, while reasserting our shared non-recognition policy and any related measures. Our Ukrainian friends and partners can continue to count on us and on our vocal action in this regard, including through our support for multilateral resolutions concerning the status of Crimea and the situation of its inhabitants. Let me stress our deep concern for the dire situation of human rights in the peninsula under Russian control, with continued reports of violations perpetrated also against the Crimean Tatar community. Moreover, Crimea and its facilities were used and continue to serve its offensive actions, including against critical infrastructures. Dear guests, rest assured that Italy will remain committed to supporting your country's territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders, its full sovereignty and political independence and freedom, as well as to contribute to address the security concerns of Romania and of the Republic of Moldova through our air policing mission and acknowledge the strategic relevance of the Black Sea as a hotspot for the Atlantic Alliance. With regard to such commitments, talking, talking about the future configuration of a prosperous and secure Black Sea region, in the next few days, uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Antonio Tajani on the 26th of April will host in Rome a bilateral high-level event about the contribution that Italy can provide to the resilience and reconstruction of Ukraine. Both governments, including the international financial institutions and business companies, will be involved since, as already mentioned, winning the war is the priority of today. Winning the peace must and will be the common challenge and duty of tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the last statement, Manfred Seid, uh, General Director of the New Commission. Excellences, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor uh, to, for me to address this conference on behalf of the Danube Commission, which uh, safeguards uh, the Danube Convention, uh, thus uh, ensures free and non-discriminatory navigation on one of the most important European waterway uh, corridors. As a result of the Russian Federation's aggression against Ukraine, the member states of the Danube Commission excluded in March uh, 2022 the Russian Federation from all its uh, working groups and expressed a strong will to work on a new agreement that limits future membership to the uh, Danube Riparian states. Since May 2022, uh, the Danube Commission supports uh, the European Commission in implementing the EU-Ukraine Solidarity Lane Action Plan to facilitate Ukraine's uh, agricultural exports and bilateral trade with the European Union. Working jointly uh, together, uh, Danube Commission and European Commission support Ukraine and the Romanian authorities as well as businesses uh, in increasing the flow of goods through the Danube ports. And I might say that our joint work can be considered very successful. Since the beginning of the war, the Danube ports have handled more than 22 million tons of cargo, to a large extent uh, agricultural products. The Ukrainian Danube ports alone offer now a daily transshipment capacity of up to 100,000 uh, tons per day. 50% of the goods are transported by sea vessel, as the Danube guarantees uh, water depths of 7.3 meters on the Sulina Canal, and 50% uh, of the cargo uh, is transported by inland vessels, mainly to the port of Constanza, where almost 5 million tons of goods from Ukraine were handled. The importance of the Danube waterway and the Danube ports uh, is reflected uh, in the 25% share of all Solidarity Lane's freight flows and comes quite closer to the 28 million tons of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. So uh, a lot has been achieved, but a lot still has to be done. 
Further investment in the ports uh, and in the hinterland connection is needed, uh, as well as in the border crossing points. And uh, we also still have uh, to increase uh, the traffic capacity on the Sulina Canal. We think that uh, this investment is a good investment, is a good decision, because we believe that the Danube waterway and its ports will continue to play an important role in the phase of reconstruction of Ukraine. As Ukraine and Moldova are now EU accession candidates, the expansion of EU transport corridors would certainly have to include the solidarity lanes uh, and thus the Danube and its ports. The border area of Ukraine, Moldova and Romania has not only a huge potential for agricultural uh, goods and uh, is an important logistic hub, but also offers high economic potentials for re renewable energy production. This is already reflected in Ukraine's hydrogen strategy, for example. Therefore, the Danube and the Danube ports are indispensable elements now and in the future of a prospering Ukraine. A great opportunity for sustainable transport in the region and they can offer via short sea shipping services important trade connections to the Black Sea countries of highest geopolitical importance such as, uh, such as uh, Turkey uh, and Georgia. The Danube Commission will therefore continue to support the European Commission uh, in its efforts uh, for a secure and proper, uh, prosperous region with the Danube as a core transport uh, corridor and the gateway to the Black Sea. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I was signaled by the organizers that we need to complete earlier because of the different plans of the ministry. So I uh, really thank you uh, for your participation. I really thank you for everyone being here for this, I believe, just the beginning of the discussion about the future of our Black Sea region. And I hope to see all of you next year on the Black Sea coast in Ukraine. Thank you.
Asta-i. Doi zece, provotesc. 